Good morning and welcome back to the other faces. Welcome to part two of A Dance with Dragons. Yes, yes, you were here last week, but still welcome back. It's very good to have you here. I am Sir Buckley talking to you from, well, it's still fairly sunny here in jolly old England slash the Isle. It's getting a bit cloudy, it's getting a bit windy, but summer's hanging on, which I approve of. Although I say that, I look out the window now and it has started raining. Never mind, we'll soldier on. Yes, hello, hello. Like I say, part two of 19, remember, of Dance with Dragons. I hope you enjoyed our first episode last week. The download numbers and the shares on the tweets and everything like that suggest that you did. So thank you, everybody, for being a part of that, listening or downloading or sharing or whatever you did. Very, very much appreciated. While I'm giving thanks, let me, of course, mention our wonderful, wonderful patrons. You keep me going. You keep the aisle running. I especially today would like to point out KM and Lord Commander Namian Darkin. They are especially generous in their support. It's so very much appreciated, but much love to all the patrons and all that they do. You really do make it all worth it. And while talking of patron, very quickly here before we get going, you might have seen on Twitter that yesterday was the first of some extra benefits that I've been waffling on about on the Patreon page. It is some of my own fiction writing for all our patrons on the five dollar a month or more tiers. They're going to be receiving some of my own writing just as an extra. It's not replacing anything. This is still an Asphalt podcast, don't you worry, but just something extra some people might be interested some might not either is fine with me either way the first one up yesterday i decided to go big so it was an eight thousand more like eight and a half really eight and a half thousand word short story named charlie's choice that is up for our patrons now hopefully you might have had a chance to have a glance or we'll get to soon for our wonderful patrons you know to reach me with uh, any comments and thoughts kind or otherwise don't you worry and if the rest of you out there would like a little look well you know where to go head over to patreon.com slash other faces there's that there's other extra benefits coming as well as all the old stuff as well now while i'm talking to all non-patrons out there last week yes it's true i promised you as a welcome back because we'd had such a long layoff that i would put the first episode part one onto the public stream at the same time as the patron stream and i didn't and why is that it's because podbean threw a bit of a paddy it wouldn't let me do it had a little bit of confusion over passwords and locked me out for a day so to make up for it today is when you'll receive everything the same as patrons one day only that's right this week here on a monday patrons will get it earlier still but you will get it the same day for all non-patrons so that's just a little welcome gift saying welcome back thanks for coming back to the other faces because like i say you did in droves last week with those download numbers but now let's start talking about part two shall we so we're in our usual form now last week was three chapters because those prologues well they are a beast aren't they definitely this one definitely a beast this time we're on our normal four and i think that's how we're going to be going heading forward four chapters a week so let me introduce you into who we're going to be talking about today we'll start with john one we're back to the wall we're establishing what john is up to it's going to be very very similar to what we ended with last week with daenerys in terms of setting up problems and well the realities of rule which aren't always too kind. We'll then move to Bran 1. Yes, Bran, remember that kid? It's been a long old time, but we have another Bran chapter. He is back above the wall, he's struggling on, and yes, wouldn't you know it, things are pretty dark for him as well. Can you see a theme occurring here? I think I can. Then it will be Tyrion 2, bit sunnier. We're out on the road, Ilio and Tyrion in their litter, discussing the world and how to put it right. Well, well how to get something out of it at least. And then finally, we'll end with our first new POV of the book, Quentin Martell slash The Merchant's Man. Yes, I do go on a bit of a nerd dive about titled chapters and their frequency as well. So you've got that to look forward to. It is, I'll admit, a long podcast. So settle in. There's lots and lots to talk about. I'm definitely looking forward to it. In fact, I'll tell you what, we'll have a bit of a competition. So I've just named those four chapters there. You know what's coming today. Have yourself a little guess on which of those chapters do you think I'll spend the most time on? And I'll tell you at the end of the podcast. Don't worry, you don't have to look it up or put your time on anything. I'll put the same question to Twitter and see what they say and see how many of you get the right answers. I think that's about it for intro today. I'm sure you're all already checking out Valoridis on Sunday nights with Aziz and Ashea. I don't really think I need to remind you. I know you're all there and supporting anyway. Again, you have my wonderful thanks, patron or not, for your support and listening. Let me know what you think. Give some comments. What did I get right? What did I get wrong? What do you think about these questions? We always like to hear from you. And yes, some of my own writing on the Patreon page now. Charlie's Choice. Have a look at that if you'd like. Yeah, I think that's it. Let's get going, shall we? Last week, we got to two of the big three of this book. So we'll start now by finishing off with the last one of that trio with John 1. 
Yes, we're rounding out this magical trio, the big Triforce, with the one we'll actually spend the most time with in terms of total chapters. We've spoken about John so much in the prep episode and just through all these comparisons with Danny and Tyrion, but we should give a lot of respect to John's dance arc in general because it truly is amazing. I believe it might be my favourite of the three. Danny is a strong contender, but John just builds on his brilliant storm arc and probably holds the larger interest for me personally, so I think he takes top spot. Yes, there are many, many comparisons of tough ruling and tough decisions, the desire to save a people even to your own detriment, but seeing John work as Lord Commander and try to change the watch, and more importantly, essentially try to save the world, is a wonderment. Again, we have so many factors we're going to have to consider as we go. We start with Stannis, then we'll get left with Melisandre and Mance, there's different pockets of wildlings everywhere to deal with, different factions within Castle Black, from the Queen's Men, etc., the Iron Bank shows up. And we have Starvation, Winter itself, the Promise of Aya, and, well, the others, let's not forget. And finally, the question of loyalty in Jon's own men. John is a man trying to do the right thing by saving people. That's what it comes down to, same as Daenerys. And due to his near unique experiences, he's doubling up on the saving. He's saving wildlings from becoming whites, sure, but also minimising the other's recruitment, the other's weaponizing of uh, the wildlings and other dead people. He tries to repair the watch with switching to archery and getting the other castles ready, and does all these things that we really should have seen done years ago, so you know how much we really relish that we've been talking about that kind of thing for a long time, and John steps up to actually do it. He takes on, really, the most responsibility out of anyone in the stories now. He really is looking after everybody we know about. But for him personally, it's just wonderful to see his growth as a leader. He starts off kind of weary, kind of resigned. He doesn't respond to digs or threats. He's not teaching lessons of a sword anymore. He's the leader. He's the coach. And that'll be harder as he goes. Everything will wear on him just a little bit more. He will start snapping a few times because everyone's going to keep being a moron around him. They keep resisting to his ideas. He's going to to suffer rudeness and insubordination from Selyse Baratheon and others. Doubts are going to come from literally every angle. Everything he does is going to be questioned left, right and centre and it's going to get damn annoying. Until we find that eventual break where he says, right, screw you guys, I'm going to get my sister. And I think you know how much that mirrors Daenerys' end as well. Like with Storm, Jon must answer whether he is a wolf or a crow. We thought he'd made peace with kind of being both by signing up for the duty of a crow. He had all those thoughts on Winterfell and Rob at the end of Storm, but that was before recent events really bring the argument right up into his face. It's easy enough when you've not seen any of your family for years and they're all miles away and you think they're all dead anyway. But now you were hearing about your father's seat being taken by Boltons. You were hearing about your sister not only being alive but near you. Your favourite person in the whole world. And then she's being forced to marry. And then she's maybe even coming closer to you. So that's a whole different ball game. That's so much more difficult to comprehend and is a much more entertaining read for us. John actually does a great job of sticking to his duty and just saying, I, I said these vows. It was my choice. I've left all that behind. I'm going to have to stick to my decision and basically I'm going to be a Ned here. I said this thing, I'm going to do this thing. That's the lesson of Eddard Stark. He manages to focus on the large issues, the all-important stuff, kind of up until right at the end. And we can't blame him as readers because we know how much effort he puts in throughout the book. We know how he's given away the shot of his own life and own choices and his reputation even as a Lord Commander or even respect with what he's done with the Wildlings. And we also know, and I've spoken about many times, how a reunion with Aya would be the most emotionally hard-hitting of anything in the series. The only possible contender I can see would be Aya and Sansa re-meeting, but I still have this in the top spot. So you just can't blame him for taking any shot at that, can you? Now let's not forget, this is the most important arc for this series as a whole, in my opinion. I know we've got Daenerys and she's not far behind at all, but this is the protection of the world we are talking about. Maybe Danny will get there eventually, but John's here right now. This is the war against the others. It's the whole point of the books. That's the whole point of the series. In the prepper episode, we spoke a lot about John personally, but perhaps that was a disservice because there's just so much happening at the wall in general throughout this book and especially at the end. We said Tyrion was the most highly anticipated chapter of dance, arc of dance that everyone wanted to get to, but the wall slash Castle Black is the clear favourite for wins. Not just because of this massive cliffhanger we've got with Jon and his potential resurrection and the thousands of possibilities that come with it, but the sheer number of plot threads to consider that aren't even Jon himself. The Miranese knot is real, but it's really nothing compared to Castle Black. Remember, Jon dies at the end in the middle of chaos. This is a mutiny by some members of the Night's Watch, but not all. So how is that going to resolve in the immediate? Will Bowen Marsh and his accomplices try to escape to another castle, like the Night Fort or something? Will they hole up in a part of Castle Black? Is someone going to try and seize actual power? And there are still Jon loyalists around, so does this just descend into a bloodbath? Very possible. Depending on how long Jon is out of action, the leadership and direction of the entire Night's Watch is 
is going to be called into question at the worst possible time for dissension. We do not have time for, to do this all again. That was supposed to be sorted in Storm. But killing your own Lord Commander is not going to be a small deal. There are going to be a lot of people saying this was wrong, we can't have this, and basically just a lot of arguing to come. And don't forget, there are other fights happening as John dies. We've got a giant raging in the yard. The Queen's men are probably going to get involved with that. Then the wildlings might react to that, or they might react to John's death, given what he's done for them and how they were kind of championing him at the end. So we could have three different factions going at each other mere seconds after John's death. Whether we will get to see all of that live from the early Melisandre chapter, or have to wait for a roundup later on, remains to be seen, but it's fascinating either way. And again, that's just the immediate. All those factions have long-term questions as well. Will Solis get to the Nightfall? How are Tormund and Val going to react? Will the Wildlings now stay at Castle Black? Or are they going to go to the castles where they're supposed to be going? Or are they just going to do what they want and go everywhere and start raiding? Are they Are just going to stay and fight against the Night's Watch? We don't know. Even moving away from Castle Black, we have to figure out the truth of the Pink Letter, what's going on there. Obviously, the result of the Battle of Winterfell is going to have huge repercussions for those on the wall. If Stannis wins and he wants to come back up, or whatever happens really, that wave is going to spread out right to the wall very quickly. We want to find out what Melisandre is going to do. Is she going to burn Shireen? What her what are her larger aims for the ending? There was everything going on at Hard Home to consider, with the enslaving of wildlings and dead things in the water. There are still rangers out there, and Alice Fawn and the Weeper, and are we going to see Gren and Ed again? And oh yeah, th let's not forget, the others are still coming. Wind is going to be absolutely fascinating for all these reasons, for all these many, many, many different plot threads and uh, factions and everything else, and for the very different John experience that we're going to be getting. So we had best set it up with a strong dance arc, and don't worry, because we surely, surely do. So let's start that off now, shall we? We start in John 1, as we may well start in Winds, with John inside Ghost. No, we don't get a short, simple line to start this time, just the naming of the White Wolf. It's another early link back to the prologue. It's been a very long time since we've had Wargame within three chapters so close together, considering we've got Bran up next. So we're really, really shoring up all that John Vamir stuff that we discussed at length in that prologue chapter. The early lines focus on the nature of winter, on snow, and on the moon specifically. There's a lot more moon watching in this book, it feels like in Bran's chapters, and in Varamir also. The White Wolf that is named so here could also end up actually being John's name, how people refer to him after resurrection, so look out for that. Now that's the setting sorted, fine, but what is the White Wolf, what is this warg actually thinking about here? Well, very early on we get this really interesting paragraph about his pack mates, his family. Ghosts can feel Shaggy Dog and Nymeria, so you know we're going to be jumping all over any hints we can get on them, because we love the direwolves, but especially for Shaggy Dog, because we don't know anything about him, do we? All we learn, actually, is that he's aggressive and big enough now to take down a large goat, but not skilled enough to do it unscathed. That obviously leaves us wanting more, because we always want to look after the direwolves, and it's been such a long time since we've heard anything of Shaggy Dog or Recon. So we're thinking, okay, where are the goats? Can we discern anything? Where could they possibly be? What are they up to? And that doesn't really give us anything, but it does just bring them back into our mind that they are still out there somewhere they're doing something and that's obviously going to tie into the davos chapter later on nymeria we know a bit more of thanks to feast but we always like a listen and it's doubly cool that her extended pack that she's kind of adopted down in the riverlands and are referred to as cousins so yes we know where she is we as rereaders are assuming that shaggy dog is in skagos with rickon even if the goat is no actual clue and we don't have the wyman hints just yet but they will come but by the by just if that is true, if Shaggy Dog has remained with Rickon, because that's not confirmed, we don't know that for a certainty, that we can short cross our fingers, if he has gone over to Skagos with Rickon, I'm pretty sure that makes him the only direwolf to cross the sea at any point. So good job, Sailor Shaggy Dog. But on top of those two is one family member that Ghost is aware of, but can no longer sense, and he's meaning Summer beyond the wall. So it's interesting that he's aware that Summer lives, but can't quite make a connection with him. And the not sensing isn't new, we've discussed that previously, but being aware of existence is mm, it's kind of a grey area, it's not really explained in quite that way before, or maybe these details are just becoming clearer as our Starks become more comfortable with their abilities, we're not really too sure on that bit. Emotionally, the fact that Ghost is able to pick out those three, but no more, is a bit damning, because that really says Grey Wind is truly dead. We already know about Lady, obviously, but we always hold out hope and we have theories about Grey Wind being able to jump into the river with uh, Reynald Westling and maybe get away. And perhaps there are still some margins to escape this fate that uh, Ghost is dealing out here. Lady Gwyn has a very, very popular theory that I'm sure you've all read. So we're hoping Ghost is maybe just mistaken here. We really, really are hoping, but... Uh, yeah, it is a bit of a nail in the coffin. In a moment, while having his morning piss, John will reflect on this point specifically once he's woken up. Recall, at the end of Storm, John was doing a lot of remembering and thinking about Rob because of Stannis' Winterfell offer. 
and he'll reflect on it a few more times in this early book as well. So this confirmation for Grey Wind is just extra pain for him. John will also know in a page or two's time he is becoming much stronger in his connection with the wolf dreams. They're becoming more regular, they're becoming clearer. So that's always an exciting way to start off the book. How, how good would that be if John was able to just focus on that full time and we can really see how far he would get? Unfortunately not, he's a bit busy, but still exciting to start off the book that way. Although it's an interesting opposite to Daenerys, who is feeling like her connection to the dragons is weakening, even if she may be not correct in that. We definitely want to see more wolf powers wherever we can get them, and given that hugely emotional reunion, the best reunion of the series so far, between John and Ghost and Storm, we can perhaps see it as making up for lost time. That would be a nice way to look at it. In that same paragraph, John thinks of his other brothers and their wolves, specifically whether they could be living on in their own die walls, seeing as he still believes them to be dead. Bran and Rickon we're talking about obviously here. That's always a nice wink at readers whenever anyone thinks of those two, but obviously it's this idea of living on in die walls that provides so much foreshadowing for John himself, but also back to the prologue that is so fresh in our minds. And also, it's a good question. Can they live on in their direwolves? If we're going to assume that John's going to be doing it later on, is that true for them? They're younger, are they not as powerful? We'd think, well, Bran's definitely more powerful, so maybe he can. Hopefully we never find out, although it seems Bran might end up living that life more than any other anyway. It's a shame that John never has time to explore this line of thinking about Bran and Rickon and their direwolves and the difference in fates just a bit further, because he knows the direwolves are alive, thanks to Ghost. So what's happened then? How are they alive and the brothers not? How would the direwolves have escaped the same fate? How would Summer have gotten through the wall without human help? Especially when John saw him fairly recently at Queen's Crown. Maybe he could just push Ghost a bit further in the dreams and make an effort to find them and check and just, I don't know, just find out just in case. For all we know, maybe we will see the Direwolves use their dream GPSs to help some Starks reunite out at some point. We hope. But again, John is just too busy to focus on this kind of thing. But it's a real shame. Now, back to where we actually are. As we're pounded again and again with the word snow, just to keep us on our thematic toes, John is brought back to his own body via Mormont's Raven. And this damn thing has been confusing us through the whole reread, and he isn't going to let up and dance. In fact, he becomes even more prominent. The Raven was the start of the end of Storm with his little pot trick there at the vote for the Lord Commander. Yeah, he's going to be around a lot in this book, and people are going to have to pay a lot more attention to his quarking, even more than before. Because now we have the added introduction of Blood Raven to make us wonder whether there's a hidden meaning in each interaction. This time round, he has me wondering why the Raven is screaming at John to wake up. Is he trying to keep him from walking, perhaps? Is Blood Raven really trying to speak to him? Or does he just really want him to wake up? These are the type of Raven based questions we can expect in most John chapters, with unfortunately very few answers. And just while we're talking about John waking here, he leaves Ghost in kind of a, a weird position. He hears snow said out loud. Now, is that John hearing the raven in his room or is Ghost hearing someone saying that out in the wild? Because he turns, it says the white wolf turned and bared his teeth. So is that actually happening out in the wild? If so, what is he bearing his teeth at? It says there's a raven there. Or is that John being in his room again? Very confusing. We don't really get any follow-up on that, but it is interesting where Ghost actually is and what he's doing and why he's seeing those things. Hmm, not sure. But back to his actual waking. Upon that waking, George is in a rush to get across how odd it is that John is now in a position of genuine leadership, even if we know he's been filling that role truly for a long time now, since he really got back. But now he has a steward, someone that we know, who used to be on the same level as John and Ed Tollett, so that's weird. He gets to choose his breakfast and make all orders and he notes how odd it is how different that is from when he first arrived so we naturally do the same reflecting on this journey that we've been witness to and think about how we're going to have to get used to this very new state of affairs very quickly we've been with john since he was basically the lowest of the low he's now the highest of the high but wait a minute wait a minute george has nearly gone half a page without linking something back to the prologue so let's fix that as ed and john discuss the wildling refugees still limping back to the wall after running from the battle Ed gives a specific example very, very similar to those that we saw fall to Vramir's wolves in the early pages. So it seems like one group made the right choice to turn south back to Castle Black, and one did the opposite. Unfortunately, as Ed tells us here, both included dead children anyway. So no one gets away clean in this situation, but at least some living people made it back to Castle Black. And that's actually pretty similar to the Daenerys introduction, isn't it? We start by highlighting the problem that will always plague the Ark. Stannis is one aspect, sure, but he'll leave soon. It's these wildlings that are still out there that will be the main problem for almost all of Dance. And not just because of them mounting another attack on the wall, possibly, but for what they will become if the others get them first. So that's that double problem for John that we talked about earlier. So it's good that we highlight that straight away. To follow that, let us get some setup for the big decision, the damning decision, that we already know John is going to do very soon, thanks to Sam's early feast chapter. There's two building blocks for this, and I think you know what I mean, what decision I'm talking about. 
One of them is obvious, one of them a bit more subtle. The obvious is John's thoughts on what he's overheard about Melisandre and her like of burning people alive, combined with talk by Maester Aemon about Mance's child and King's blood. Now John doesn't want to believe that anyone is capable of that, and definitely not the king that he has to now deal with, but Aemon seems pretty sure, and well, John's got to consider it, hasn't he? So that's a pretty big slap on the head there, isn't it? Okay, John, you need to do something about this or someone's going to get burnt. That's the obvious one, but what about the more subtle aspect? This comes from a few paragraphs before, where John was thinking about the problem Problem of having women on the wall. I'll read you the quote. Men were men, and these were the only women for a thousand leagues. So you can see we have the substance for his overall decision to send Gilly away here. It's two birds with one stone, three if you include Aemon. He can save the two with King's blood in Aemon and Mance's child, and actually a happy byproduct is he might save Gilly from some unwanted attacks as well. Now Aemon says better men have done worse, and I wonder if is he referring to Summerhall there? Is he referring to his own brother and what he was trying to do late in his life? Who knows? But to be fair, he has a lot of resource material to draw on for the Targaryens. He could be talking about anyone. And let's mention now, it's just damn painful to revisit Aemon here now in this early book because we know of his eventual fate. It was one thing, seeing him in feast, but we didn't know what was going to happen. Now we do. Ugh, it just tugs at the heartstrings a little bit more. Back to John. I really like him taking up Donald Noy's room. By necessity, sure, but it keeps from the trappings of power and ambition and learning from a good example. Donald Noy was undoubtedly the best leader that John ever saw at Castle Black, so he might well follow his lead in this as well. While remembering his old friend, George gives us a classic tease to keep us turning the page and giving something for us to guess over. Stannis has given John something to sign, there is something he wants, and if John agrees to it, it's going to be a big deal, even if we don't know what it is yet. So John is remembering the previous leader of Castle Black while considering how he himself is going to be remembered. Everything is public now, there's no small decisions, there's no way to get off the stage, but what is it that Stannis wants? We're made to wait a little bit longer for that. George wants to continue this idea of comparison between old John and new John. So let's highlight another core part of John's early life as a crow, the training yard. We gave a lot of attention to that back in Game of Thrones, to how much it mattered to John in those younger years. Which sounds foolish to say, given how young he still actually is. He's like 16 here. We're talking about like 14 year old John, but still. We used to do the athlete comparison for him. It was his main skill, it was the thing he hung his hat on, that's how he found worth in the world. Now he's morphed from star athlete to the head coach. There's a whole different set of skills, there's a whole different thing to deal with. So let's explore how different the whole place is for when John first really made a name for himself as a man of the Night's Watch to now. There's different recruits, there's a different instructor in the yard, it's a different time. Iron Emmett has stayed on even if we'll lose him later in the story, he's going to be sent to one of these other castles. The new recruits and fighters are part of this new generation that John was already ushering in before he even became Lord Commander. I think it was sat in with him when the wildlings were coming from the south, I think I've got that right, and you know other people. He's just being the leader, he was just being him. And again it all speaks to John preparing everyone for what's coming even if he can't partake himself anymore. Once there was a day where John would grab a training sword and get to work because it was his favourite thing. Now he can't even get out of his front door without having to deal with guards training him everywhere. And it's just strange for him. He's not used to this. He never thought he would get close to that kind of importance. Remember, growing up as a bastard, everyone else, all his other siblings, were highlighted as the big crew he was forgotten about. So of course, having guards around him is, is just weird. And it really ties in with how much John has already had to grow up. Yeah, okay, physically... It's straightforward, he's only two years older, but the difference between Game of Thrones John, Dance of Dragons John, is incredible. Although, I will mention, of course, he still can't help giving a few pointers as he passes through the yard, because you never lose your passion for the game, do you? We also get a very quick interaction with Godry Faring. We'll be seeing more of Godry Faring later in the burning of quote-unquote Mance, and on Stannis' march to Winterfell, so we need to establish him as a bit of a dick right now at the beginning. He's not as bad as Clayton Suggs, obviously, but he's still a bit of a moron. And clearly, we are meant to dislike him, giving his killing of a giant, because we love the giant. And he's set up for John to hate as well, because he's rude, he's disrespectful. He's done something that Egret would hate in this killing of a giant. He's just a bit of a thug. Old John would love nothing more than to teach him a lesson, but we're still very much establishing the trappings of power already surrounding John, because he has to take the higher road. He can't just do what he wants anymore. Godry is generally asking for it here. He really is asking for a bit of a bump on the noggin. So we'll have to spend a lot of time in this book hoping that he gets exactly what he deserves eventually. And I'm going to hit on this point again. It's just good for comparing John to his early days at Castle Black, when sparring in the yard was pretty much all he lived for whether it be with Longclaw or anything else. He knows the cost now though, he knows he must focus on other areas, and this is going to be a major theme of the whole book. We've seen John kill Whites, duel Corrin, and kill Wildlings both with sword and command in the battles later on, but there'll be next to no action of that sort here in Dance. You'd normally expect a story to ramp up the action in the other way, with more and more action, more and more sword swinging, but this is about much harder tasks than swinging a sword, and John actually has more control over life and death than ever before, 
So again, that's part of the growth of John. It's part of the growth of the story and us as readers with him. Now, John can know all that and he can be polite to Godry Fang and turn the other cheek and walk away. He knows to do that. That doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. doesn't rub the wrong way. He would love to grab a sword and teach him what for, but he can't. But clearly, the interaction bothers him greatly. He still has that pride, so he starts to rule on what's actually been left to him. And he focuses on the negative kind of with this quote here. My command, Jon Snow reflected ruefully, as much a ruin as it is a stronghold. And he's going to have a very similar line to finish a future chapter where he thinks that this is all he has for the rest of his days. I think you'll probably remember. And yes, these are still very much the easy days, actually, for John somehow. But he's also hinting here that Castle Black is in a state of repair the same way Winterfell will be later on. Again, it has us addressing how far we've come in this series. Compare what Castle Black looked like then, what it looks like now. So much of what we knew has changed, but there's no time to lament because preparations for the wildlings and maybe the others need to be dealt with now. Which is good for John and his productivity versus Gior again. Sorry, Gior, you just suck in comparison to John. Now, as John is making his way towards Stannis, we get some hints about Southerners not getting on well with the cold. It was pointed out in the yard, and now again with the guards here on Stannis' door. We will have plenty of that to come later in Asa chapters, and some with Theon as well, with the phrase they don't get on with it at all. And note that John doesn't tar all Southerners with the same brush. He might like to smack Godry Faring around, but he's very kind in this moment with offering gloves to these poor guards. He's just a cool guy. There's a reason people are going to be pissed that he gets stabbed later on. Trust me. On the way to talk with the king in the king's tower, we run into pretty much the complete opposite of Stannis, Samuel Tarly. So this is our first kind of meta moment of dance where we as readers can wink to ourselves as we smile smugly about knowing more than the characters do, because every reader always likes that. We know what happens to Sam, we know the future, and this is actually the first moment we really have to focus on the differing timeline. Tyrion and Daenerys were not involved with Feast at all, so it didn't really jump out in their chapters. But obviously here is a moment we've already seen in the past a long time ago, so it really highlights how we're still back at the beginning of the feast, and, well, don't you forget it. It's only a very, very brief interaction with Sam. We're going to get the actual crossover episode in terms of the literal conversation we've already seen in John 2, but we do get the hint of Stannis' dealing with the North that we're going to address in a second. But also about John's insistence on the focus of archery again. That's what Sam's big complaint is here. And, uh, well, Sam is getting involved, so we can't not him again it's one of john's greatest decrees it's one of his smartest things it sounds so simple stop messing around with the sword so much let's move it to like two-thirds archery please because that's going to be way 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 more useful for what we actually do here on the wall and again john mormont and previous commanders really should have figured that out earlier than this but that's already a quick goodbye to sam he'll be appearing later on don't worry we'll see him again but for now we come to the man of the hour slash Book. Stannis Baratheon is back, poised to take on his biggest role in this series yet, one might argue. I mean, a clash might come close, but I think really Dance is a Stannis book. And here's Melisandre with him, about to enter our POV lineup for the first time, so it's great to see them here making their entrance. It's a similar scene to how we almost always used to see Stannis back at Dragonstone. Mel standing beside him with her ruby pulsing, and him brooding over a map. We're going to be dealing with probably half a dozen different issues in this meeting with Stannis here. This really, this is the point of the chapter. But I think I can probably get across the first thing they're going to discuss with this quote here. Bear Island knows no king but the king of the north, whose name is Stark. We all love that line. In the prime episode, I spoke about how there are glimpses of things we really do like in this very dark book. And this is definitely one of them. After the Red Wedding and the end of Rob, Feast exploring the larger casualties of that fallout, hearing via Cersei that more and more of the Northmen have joined Roose's cause, it's easy to be pretty bleak about the Stark situation. It's been painted that we've witnessed a truly singular event, the abandonment of the Starks after 8,000 years of constant loyalty. That loyalty that travels both ways between Stark and Bannerman, at least in the time of Eddard, was really highlighted to us early on in the series in terms of its importance, rarity and specialness in this world. It was one of the bedrocks of the series. This is why they're the good guys, and that was taken away from us by those events I just mentioned. But in Dance, whether it be at Bear Island, or the Merman's Court, or the Hill Tribes coming down for the Ned, we discover the spirit of Stark is still very much alive in the North. And I honestly think that will be one of the most important themes for the end of the series. We talk a lot about the Targaryens returning, and we definitely will in this book, but the Starks still have to do the same, and I really do look forward to that. Much of this, and several early chapters of John's, is about dealing with Stannis as as much as it is about John. Even though Asher will take up Stannis' can duties later on, we'll never come close to the kind of access we have here, despite this being his most important book, like I say, since Clash at least. In some ways, we even get a bit more than we did with Davos as Stannis prepares for this upcoming war. We get to see a little bit more of him. Now, rereaders know things are going to get really, really bad for Stannis' campaign by the end of the book. Seemingly, anyway, that's how it's presented. 
Before that, we'll have a bit of success, but before that, we start down in a valley, because Stannis is learning very quickly from this quote and letter from Lyanna. The North is unlike anywhere below the neck, not just in terrain and weather, but politically and culturally. Case in point, Stannis slash Davos have spent half the series having to recruit lords to their cause, but they've never seen anything like what the Anna Mormont sends back. It honestly just boggles Stannis' mind, probably because it's from a girl more than anything. That's the hard bit he has to accept, to be honest. We can collectively agree that this quote that I read out a second ago is one of the more awesome parts of the whole book, and it's a good sign for House Mormont coming back into our lives. We were all so gutted about Daisy, so to make up for it, we're going to be given Alisanne, we have Lyanna here, and we had some theories about Mage previously. The only bad part of it is that Jorah also comes back along with them. But you can't win them all, I guess. Here's hoping the she-bears come out in force for the wars to come. Cross fingers. And Stannis, he still clearly has an ego about these types of things. Yes, some of his wanting to keep his recruitment failures, not just this one, by the way, silent is because it would damage his cause by keeping others away. But definitely there is a percentage about his personal embarrassment. This isn't supposed to be happening. This grand idea of coming north and saving the realm is supposed to endear him to the Seven Kingdoms, the North especially. So finding out the game, which he hated in the first place, is completely different in the North, is very, very vexing for him. And unknown to him, the only victory he has in the loyalty of Arnulf Karstark is actually false as well. But we won't find that out until later, when things become even more complicated with Alice Karstark, etc, etc. Just before we get into further discussion of Stannis and trying to recruit the North and why people aren't going to him, there is a very, very quick couple of lines where Jon just gets a little time to lament his previous decision about not taking up Stannis' offer of Winterfell, which plays into that Ruin quote from a moment ago. There's going to be plenty more of that to come as we go, but it is interesting that John, he thinks what could have been, and he thinks it's too late for such misgivings. You've made your choice. So that relates back to what we said earlier as well. But back to Stannis. It's kind of up to John to provide the wisdom of why the Northmen aren't rushing to join him. The worth of the wall has dimmed in their eyes. They are still nursing injuries from the War of the Five Kings. They don't want to risk what happened to the Starks, which is fair enough. If it happened to an 8,000-year-old, undefeatable house, it can happen to you too. And why would they risk it for a southerner that means nothing to them, even if John is politically smart enough to keep that part to himself? I've personally never understood the John is an idiot argument. I don't get it at all. I'll be straight up. He's not perfect. Who is? But his early meetings with Stannis and later meetings with others show how skilled he is in this arena. It's a skill he really does not get enough credit for. It really does bother me. Now on the other side, both Stannis and Melisandre genuinely believe all the Northmen should just be defaulting to their beliefs, and only John remembers the actual reality. In a moment, Stannis will curse John for never giving him pleasing answers, but really, respect is already being grown in the fact John provides only true answers. He's fully playing the Davos role here. I really love the quote, they have supped on grief and death, and now you come to offer them another serving. John just gets it, he's a smart kid. Now while we're talking about Melisandre being here, here's a little quote that John has just thinking about her. He thinks about gold. Are those the dragons the Red Woman means to wake? Dragons made of gold? I just bring that up because it seems like a little hint to the tight chain of stories thread that will come up much, much, much later. For now, it's Stannis wanting money, but we can assume the seed of Jon's later plan for food is also being planted here. He's thinking ahead, he knows what's important. Now, while Stannis is pointing out he needs money also, Jon points towards Wyman Manderley, so we have some setup for his later involvement as well. You see how George likes to sprinkle these names and themes in real early in the book, in these first chapters, so that your brain has at least four of them recently, before we have Davos turning up in White Harbour, for example. Like with squeezing his dart into Danny's chapter. It's pretty funny that Stannis dismisses someone, in Wyman, who might actually be a crucial factor in his taking of Winterfell. Or, then, an even bigger factor in him not keeping it with the Rickon theories. That's very possible. The loss of Wyman, and the perceived loss of Davos, is a pretty big blow to Stannis' chances for success, to be fair. The conversation now switches from other Northmen to the Wildlings, and like we saw at the end of Storm, a huge part of Jon's life with Stannis is basically being his liaison officer. Firstly, for those ways of the North, sure, but definitely for the ways of the Wildlings, as he again has to explain about Val and how she's not a princess as Stannis understands the word. It feels like he'll have to explain this a hundred more times yet. He has to do the same thing about Mance's son not being an heir because there's no such thing among the Wildlings, and we're really going to have our heads bang against the wall even if Jon doesn't, because we just have to repeat this over and over again and people do not get it through their fixed skulls. But that talk brings us on to the setup of another two half a storyline in Mance and the steps going forward. We have early Mance, and we're going to have later Mance with Theon. Here's a quote. I have spent hours speaking with the man. He knows much and more of our true enemy. So that's Stannis speaking about having a chat with uh, Mance, and I definitely would have liked to hear that conversation. Stannis might know even more than us now, given how clued in Mance is about the others. That's interesting, we'd never really find out. He also mentions that Mance is cunning, so you have to wonder if Mance tried to put some legal jargon on Stannis or tried to broker a deal or whatever. It may as well just have been bargaining for his people. 
we've known him to do that before but really that's unimportant for what Stannis says about Mance his life being forfeit he's got no chance I don't care what he's saying he's going to be punished because he says laws should be made of iron not of pudding amazing that needs to be pudding laws needs to be a blog name or a podcast name i might have to start another one because that's just too good to give up isn't it mance and his people were another question left to us at the end of storm and that dances in step of the wilding refugees that stannis currently holds remember there's plenty of people out in the forest but stannis already has a couple of thousand here at castle black at the moment they seem like a secondary issue when compared to mance himself but when we combine with those brought south with torment later on that will end up being the far more primary issue overall especially in terms of john personally stannis leaves soon enough it's not gonna matter too much to him john on the other hand very very important as for mance i'll be saying stannis wants him burned for a criminal Melisandre wants him burned for his blood and that is something we're actually going to see or believe we're going to have seen anyway so again that links up in John's decision to send Gilly and Dallas Child and Mace Damon away like we saw earlier this is the why because Melisandre has been so intent on burning Mance and the fact that Stannis is willing to go along with it in fairness he's only doing that because of Mance's crimes against the realm but you aren't going to risk him not doing it again on that telecanty John is already wondering if Stannis is really this kind of person and this conversation doesn't instill confidence on that note it does beg the question of whether John would have still sent them away if he'd been told the burning was only a ruse, but my guess is yes, he's not going to risk it on the word of Melisandre or of Stannis to be honest. He needs to save those people, even if he has to get a big dart to do it, but that's in John 1. We move from Mance to possibly the bigger point of the chapter. It certainly is to John anyway. His having to stand up to a king and say no. You remember that kind of hint that we got from George that Stannis wanted something? Well, now we find out what it is. John has to scupper Stannis' grand plan of taking the castles, by remanning them with the men of the Night's Watch instead. Now Stannis already has the Night Fort anyway, but this is a consistent thread throughout the book as an effort to get the damn wall ready for the really big problem coming south. The only true problem. But is there time? Will it work? Can these castles be restored? Uh, nah, probably not. But at least John is putting forth the effort. Some of them might be ready. And humanity would rather have six castles defending the wall in free even if it doesn't know it yet consider that john is also working with the worst night's watch in history so far as we know in terms of numbers and resources again i'm gonna beat the point over the head this is the kind of thing Jor mormont should have been bothering to do back in the day when he had a few more hands to spare and winter was still a way off especially when he started getting all these clues that made him start questioning stuff that we again talked about way back in the day still it's too late for that so john has to be the one to put forth some kind of effort i'm very interested to see what will become of john's plans considering the ending of the book but it actually takes us a few pages before john bravely puts his foot down on the issue and we really should be giving him more credit for doing that against a clearly intimidating character with a huge age advantage and a king no less first we have to have stannis throwing a proper little strop about how unhelpful john is being he's at his most flippant slash sarcastic here even while john is providing solid advice on the optics of stannis's request northmen might not be rushing to lend aid to the watch but if they hear a southerner has come to take the castles of the institution they've all been historically linked with no 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 they're not gonna have that the night's watch is theirs to ignore and no one else's it is their thing you do not get to come up and stick your oar and take their castles. We also get a lightning quick Sansa mention, so that notoriety she's earned for being Tyria's wife, or Lady Lannister as she's called here, might end up being interesting if it is Stannis who holds Winterfell when Sansa, as we all expect, eventually does come north, especially if she's got an army at her back. We also return to Gilly for a second, with Jon and Melisandre dancing a delicate dance about her being sent south, while Stannis is busy having his eyes pop out of his head, over by the map with this talk of Craster and him being Gilly's father slash husband. He's kind of pulling a, a real Basil Fawlty right now. And if you don't know that reference, uh, don't talk to me. It's while Stannis is having this little uh, freak out here that he mentions the word abomination. So we're really getting that a lot early on here. He even gets a dig in about Cersei and her children down in King's Landing. And he's not wrong. We've just read through Feast after all. So that's a good joke, Stannis. Well done. But most of all is Stannis just being kind of ungrateful. His mind is too singular. He's too focused on what he's up to. We know this already from previous books. He can't empathise with John's plight. He sees the rags and porridge that John gives and he considers it poor because he refuses to reflect on how valuable those rags and porridge actually is to the Night's Watch and what that might mean about what needs to be prioritised here. If, if this is their best stuff, we really should be sorting them out with some better stuff, but no, that doesn't get through to him. Somehow, throughout all the insults and Stannis being weird, John manages to keep his cool by going full Night's Watch pride mode. He cites the history of the Night's Watch, what they have given, 
He even busts some of the oath out, which is always cool. This is all done in the risk of Stannis Baratheon's wrath, which we've already seen plenty of evidence of. It could mean disaster for Jon, or the Night's Watch total, but Jon impressively remains stuck to his guns. Again, he is really, really skilled in this area. To that end, Jon is even willing to really blur the lines of Night's Watch conduct. He'll allow men to serve and not take the oath. Don't think that's ever been done before, no one's mentioned it. He'll meet Stannis halfway and let his men actually fill the castles if Jon can provide the commanding officers. It's a grand plan, a considerable concession on Jon's part, and is absolutely pointed towards the larger, more important goals. Stannis stared at him incredulously, then gave a bark of laughter. You are bold enough, Snow. I grant you that. So, not many people make Stannis laugh, so yeah, Jon really is in the inner circle here. But rather than speak on the offer, Stannis tries to poke holes in Jon's credibility as Lord Commander. We have the threats of heads on spikes, a reminder that Alice of Thorn and Janos Slit are around making trouble still, and the fact that Jon's rule is not seen as secure by everyone. Obviously, that's going to come up huge at the end of the book, even if it doesn't involve the parties we're highlighting here. So whether this is a life that Jon really wants or deserves, He's full on leaning into it either way, and in doing the right thing. I took an oath, your grace. The wall is mine. I just love that confidence. And again, important to establish for this book early on, that he's just going to do what is best for the Night's Watch. Screw everyone else. I just love that confidence. He's going to do right by what the Night's Watch have given and continue to give. He's going to do right by Sansu, says that Winterfell should go to her. He's not going to bow down to pressure. He's going to do what's right. And it, it kind of works. Stannis agrees, not happily. But agrees, okay, you can keep the castles, even if he does tag on a threat that when the year is out, he'll take them anyway, etc, etc. Well, let's see if you get out of Winterfell alive first, Dennis. But still, John is successful. Again, let's give some love to his skill here. That he goes into this negotiating with a very, very stubborn man, a king no less, and he comes out with kind of what he wants. Not everything what he wants, but let's call this a win. Now to finish, after this conversation with Stannis, we have a small scene between Melisandre and Jon as she walks back with him to his chambers. We get a reminder that she doesn't feel the cold, there's physical touch between the two, just to raise our interest a little bit. And Melisandre mentions there is a possibility of the Red God's priest sometimes translating the fires wrong. Jon should really heed that given how wrong Melisandre is going to be later in the book, and what we find out during her single chapter. But of course he has no knowledge of that yet. She also speaks on the wall, this hinge of the world. It definitely feels like such to us, both within the world and when looking at the story structure. This is a very, very famous thing across pop culture now, the wall. We all know what we're talking about. This is one of our base building blocks. So we really like that Melisandre is not only noting that, but also the fact she seems like she is admiring it or something. She knows something of its true nature, and we want to know more about that. So our interest in her, always so high, goes a bit higher in time for her next chapter, or her first chapter. We do have magic barrier questions for later though. How does Mel pass? Does the kind of man she has matter to the wall? Can she just do what she wants? Well, we don't know. We don't know what she is. We don't know what kind of magic the wall blocks. But it's very interesting. We will see later on. Let's get a quote from Mel here. Ice I see, and daggers in the dark. Blood frozen red and hard, and naked steel. It was very cold. So Mel also gives us straight line warnings to the end of the book, as John does show off some of his own stupidity when being convinced that he knows where his enemies are. Come on, John, have you not been paying attention to the books? That's when you know you're screwed, when you think you know where the enemies are. Melisandre already knows she'll have to be near John when his time comes. She even tells him to keep ghosts nearby. So we really have to ask if she is all in on this particular vision and knows it is near fact that John will be stabbed and have to go into ghost. Does she know he can do that? Does she understand the mechanics? Could she even view this as something that needs to happen to get John to where he needs to be in his ultimate role for humanity? Now we know for her chapter later on she's not really sure what John is but she knows he's important. We do have to raise a lot of very important questions here which gives a lot of hints to John's ending. But then she manages to completely distract us from that important message by being totally creepy, freaking John out and really making us wonder how damn powerful it is when she says this. It is always cold on the wall, said John. You think so? I know so, my lady. Then you know nothing, Jon Snow, she whispered. Oh yeah, that is damned effective. How the hell does she work this? As far as I remember, there's nothing in her POV to explain how she pulls off this particular trick, because it seems way, way more magical than half her stuff. And it really gets us going for this potential relationship between the two that's going to be very, very important, especially come wins. Whatever Stannis gets up to, and what, we don't know yet whether Mel's going to go with him, etc. But, but wow, that really does raise the interest, doesn't it? So overall, it's a great intro to a great arc. There is so much to look forward to, and this is a great roundup of many key aspects. It's John in charge, John the man. And there we end the intro of the big three. And I'd say we saved the best for last. We've got the core of the book nailed already. These are our Triforce. This is what we're going forward with. Even if we have bunches more POVs to include just yet, this is really the essence of Dance of Dragons we've already covered. So there endeth John 1. Okay, so let's keep moving on. We'll go now to Bran 1. 
Yes, we are back to Bran. Finally, as mentioned before in the prep episode, he has the longest gap between any two chapters aside from Theon. He was the first Stark POV child and therefore top tier character to disappear from the narrative, apart from the ones who disappear forever, obviously, and that absence has obviously been felt. He's the top magical character. He's got a lot of promise for the future and the next steps of his learning almost have to coincide with a progression in the big problem plot. So we're really keen to get back to him. It's actually been 74 total chapters since we last had a brand. Hence why we earlier had Varimir noting him, John thinking about him, we had lots of winter talk already, so it's about time we actually focus on someone in the midst of it all. Now I'm not going to go on too much about Bran's overall art in this book because, like I say, we've already had a lot of it in Varimir, in, even in John, and of course in the prep episode. So we're not going to go too much about the three chapters here, we're going to go fairly quickly into Bran 1. As a quick reminder though, the last time we saw Bran was in that brilliant, brilliant Night Fort chapter, when he and the others passed through the Black Gate so we definitely had that magical vibe going then the mystery the eeriness of the night fort and that continues now with them going along with cold hands to figure who they and we still haven't figured out yet yes we did have that quick very quick glimpse of them in Vamir as his body rushed around or his soul rushed around rather but other than that we don't know we did have a cliffhanger Bran did go through the black gate we didn't know what was going to happen on the other side we didn't know where we were going to meet him in dance and well Let's find out, shall we? Let's get going. Yet again, let's begin with the opening line, which reads as this. Are we there yet? As we've found through the first few chapters of this book, the first line is often telling us a lot of what we need to know about this grand gap, what's happened in between. In this case, this opening line tells us Bran is still travelling on the other side of the wall. He has not found what he is looking for yet, and he's not began his training whilst we've been busy with Feast. He is still journeying. Bran is often associated with the journey. People say he has a lot of travel log chapters, despite being nearly exclusively stuck at Winterfell in Game and Clash. But for Storm, it was all journeying, almost all outside in the wild. And that'll be true for the majority of this book too, two of his three chapters. That's actually a bit surprising for us, I feel. When we think Dance Bran, we just think of Cave Bran. That third and final chapter is clearly his most important in an age. It's got bunches for us to think on and theorycraft about and amaze over. There's the flashes of ancient history and hidden mysteries, even glimpses of characters that we've loved and lost, and some we have never even saw at all, but we know them. And yet, it all has this, this big dark background of sacrifice and questionable origins. It is, unquestionably, magical, that end of Bran's arc. So it's a tough ask for these first two Bran chapters to stand against that, and the result is that one and two do fade and mix a little bit. I don't think these two would be easily picked out if we were to ask you beforehand. It's also a little bit meta because both us and Bran himself really wanted him to just get there and progress the story. Part of that is because we know how cool slash important it is going to be if and when he does get there. Part of it is because we know firsthand how dangerous the lands above the wall are at the best of times, let alone now. John and Sam have both shown up to the various dangers there now. It was no accident that George made Bran and Sam cross paths, so the tension is high right from the get-go, considering what Sam had to make it through just to get to that point. Sam escaped all of that horror, Bran's now heading straight into it. We know that Bran, Hodor, Mira and Jojen, and presumably Coldhands, are out in a dangerous land and we need to see how they are going to get out of it. Following the opening line, Bran begins with a description of the land and how winter is taking it. There's bare trees and frozen streams, snow slopes and crevices, cold, cold, cold everywhere. So the slow trickling away of life in Bran's arc is already present. He's left behind the realms of men, the Seven Kingdoms. Now he's leaving behind the signs of life in nature. Soon he's going to disappear below the ground as we covered at length in that prepper episode. We've seen the devastation this climate has done to huge forces of grown men. Bran and the others are just children. So it's no wonder that their youngest, he's still only eight or nine remember, is asking questions any kid asks on a journey, not rife of death. So you probably are going to ask them right now, aren't you? The opening page was really just more of the same. We have Hodor with frozen eyes and an icicle beard. These physical signs are already weighing heavy on our hearts, but the climate has had a clear effect on the characters as well. It's not like Storm was an easy cakewalk for them, but it sure seems like it now in comparison. What they wouldn't give for that little cave or an afternoon back at Queen's Crown. But the stories they used to tell each other are gone. Hodor is no longer happily saying Hodor. No one's happy. Everyone's hungry. It's rough stuff. So it fits in well with what we've seen from the beginning of this book, these opening chapters we've talked about, of establishing how rough the situation is for everybody. Again, it's tone. George is saying, everything's bad. We get that straight away. 
But to stoke our interest fires, we have Cold Hands and its magical elk. We get confirmation that Bran and the others did indeed meet him on the other side of the Black Gate and are now travelling with him, opening up a whole bunch more questions about who he was in life and what he is now in terms of death. And this is something that Bran and the others are going to explore more as the chapter goes on, this unwillingness to deal with something representing death, even though it might be their only chance at life, which is a pretty good way of describing Bloodraven and perhaps Bran if you think about it. For now, we just have the description of the elk doubling down on how bad the weather is with his walking through snowdrifts and his antlers being as crusted with ice as Hodor's beard. We get a reminder of what Sam ended one of his chapters with back in the day, the hands being black and cold and hard, hence the name, and the fact that we can't see Cold Hand's face. His cloak is only described as hooded here, which is interesting, but his scarf is black. So we can begin the guessing game early on on who Cold Hands was or is, and later we can wonder about what power he might hold or even serve. The reintroduction to the group continues as the camera swings around onto House Reed for a quick paragraph. Back when they first appeared to us, they were happy and healthy, confident and at one with the land, but now they are clinging together just for warmth, and poor Jojen is reported as looking even weaker than Bran, so it's not a good start, is it? That death theme we discussed a lot in the Prime episode, in terms of Bran's overall arc, really hasn't wasted time in raising its head, has it? Not only in this cold, gloomy setting, but in Jojen seemingly just wasting away. That's another tragedy to fit into Bran's arc with just three chapters, the miserable end supposed end of Jojen Reed. You may well have saved the world by awakening and leading Bran to where he needs to be. Now that is an assumption on our part that he actually does die at the end, but to be honest even if he hasn't, it's a pretty dark book for Jojen either way. For the reason general, Jojen likely isn't only freezing and starving, he's doing it in the knowledge that he's going to die. And that burden is semi-shared by Mira, who has to sit and watch this happen to her beloved brother, whilst then also spending all her time down in a dark cave full of bones later on in the book. This is her reward for doing the impossible and getting Bran here, to possibly watch her brother die and then be forgotten herself. That's a bit of an addendum, so we'll return to that later, but it's worth considering from the off, just so we are appreciating both these reads through Bran's three chapters, and this one specifically. Yes, we'll definitely talk more about Jojen at the end, seeing as he gets the final line today. Finally, we get a reminder that poor Summer took on an arrow while saving John at Queen's Crown and he still carries a bit of a limp. And if you are anything close to the animal lover I am, you know any hint of the direwolves being hurt or sad is about a hundred times worse than anything else we hear of. Oh, poor Summer. We're also told that Bran is actually inside Summer's body more than his own at the moment, purely for the feeling of comfort more than anything. That's something else we'll come back to focus on in a minute when Summer goes off hunting, but even on this early page, we're reminded of the long gone warnings, the ones we got right at the beginning, that Jojen used to give about spending too much time in a body other than your own. And that's without getting into all the Varamir stuff, but don't worry, that comes up near immediately, because that steals the show and really pricks our attention for this chapter, when, almost nonchalantly, Bran freezes our hearts with this little description. I'll read it to you at length. Other times, when he was tired of being a wolf, Bran slipped into Hodor's skin instead. The gentle giant would whimper when he felt him, and thrash his shaggy head from side to side, but not as violently as he had the first time back at Queen's Crown. He knows it's me, the boy liked to tell himself. He's used to me now. Even so, he never felt comfortable inside Hodor's skin. The big stable boy never understood what was happening, and Bran could taste the fear at the back of his mouth. Ugh, good gravy, what a sick feeling that really does leave in our mouths. I think it would, even if we hadn't been given Varamir's prologue. But with it, it's just dire. And unfortunately, we have to focus on it now, because this is the lone thought Bran gives to his warging of Hodor in the whole chapter, this one little paragraph. That seems amazing given all the focus it had in the prologue, but to Bran, it just doesn't seem that big of a deal. It's something easy, he's doing it all the time now. And that makes it all the worse, considering we know it is the very biggest of deals for Hodor. Right away we have that uncomfortableness of not being able to blame Bran, he's a child, no one's teaching him, he doesn't know the rules or the barriers, no, nothing like that. He's an innocent, but we also know that something very, very wrong is happening here, so let's wade in a bit further. There's something about the word whimper that really gets to me. The gentle giant would whimper. That just strikes such a painful note, and that particular word will much later do the same for potentially the most upsetting sentence in the entire series. I've tweeted about that recently, so you might know what I'm talking about, but that's much, much, much later. For now, Hodor, for all his strength and size, is already a very vulnerable, in times defenceless person. He already relies on kindness and understanding to get through life, but obviously is even more vulnerable now against this kind of attack from Bran. Because attack is what this is. Bran just doesn't realise it because it seems so easy to him. Now, this seems like a lucky combination of factors. Firstly, Bran is likely far more powerful than Varamir, so the taking of humans is easier, even if it shouldn't be, as Jojen noted in Storm. Secondly, Hodor's defences are likely weaker than Thistle's were, so he doesn't get the chance to thrash and fight and throw Bran out like she did with Varamir in the prologue. Except, and this really does hurt, 
he did thrash at the beginning. He did try to fight. He was just unsuccessful. So there's the horrible, gut-wrenching possibility that Hodor is feeling every bit of anguish that Thistle did. He just doesn't have the capacity to show it. That's just awful to think about in every way. We saw what happened to Thistle. That made us very, very uncomfortable. The idea that Hodor is even experiencing a tenth of that. I don't want to think about it. It's going to be expanded on in later Bran chapters. Again, it's not even noteworthy to Bran at this point, but the thought of a truly devastated and hurt and confused Hodor just having to put up with this, it really is too much to bear. It becomes even more complicated as he clearly retains his sanity when Bran returns to his own body. He isn't tearing his own face apart like Thistle did. He isn't even running away like Varamir's animals. So is that because Bran is more powerful? Or perhaps because Hodor's lowered mental capacity is actually protecting him from the worst in some way? We can hope, but I wouldn't hold your breath. Perhaps it's simply because he loves Bran and is so loyal he wouldn't even leave him for this violation. I know, heartbreak city again. What about the sentence, he knows it's me, the boy liked to tell himself. He's used to be by now. Liked to tell himself. To me, that's indicating Bran knows this is untrue and is actually really bad for Hodor. He's just trying to soften the blow to his own guilt instead. He backs that up by admitting that however many times he does this, it never feels quite comfortable to him and Hodor never understands. Oh, yes, that does hurt again. And the poor guy is always, always afraid. And we can talk about Bran only being a child and not knowing the rules and not having a proper teacher yet. He hasn't read the Varamir chapter, but we do have to hold some accountability here. He knows Hodor is uncomfortable and afraid. That should be enough for him not wanting to do it anymore. He should care about Hodor enough to save him from that, but he doesn't. So is this um, class thinking slipping in? Is Bran subconsciously thinking Hodor is not as good as him or worth as much because he's a servant? We certainly hope it's not because of Hodor's special needs status. It could even be as simple as he's being told constantly he's the chosen one, basically, and is starting to see others as tools. Whatever the reason, it should not be happening and we do have to lay that at Bran's feet. And it would be easier if we could pass this off as something that needs to happen for helping the group or keeping them warm or whatever it may be, but it's not. Right at the top of the quote, Bran says he just does it whenever he's bored of summer. Uh, uh, uh. Poor Hodor, having his soul toyed with because someone is bored. Again, we'll revisit this at much greater length in the following chapters. I'd actually forgotten we had it addressed this early in Bran's arc. I thought it was safe for later on, but obviously not. George gives us the early hit here so that everything we learn in Varamir's prologue is still fresh and we can really feel sick about what Bran is up to. Back to the story proper. Instead of focusing on Hodor, like he should be, Bran is thinking about summer and how natural that link still feels. It's as easy as breathing, so his skills have progressed in that respect as well. Specifically, he's thinking about how Summer keeps viewing the elk as prey, something that Bran catches himself doing from time to time. So there's some early tension setting from George as well. Will Summer attack the elk? Will Bran be in Summer's skin while it's happening, and give in to the instincts of the wolf, possibly making an enemy of cold hands, and likely sentencing them to die in the snow without any transport? Finally, to complete the group are the ravens, this strange, huge mass of them that Sam first spied in the Weirwood tree and end up saving him and Gilly from the Whites. Only a few stay near them in the day, but then perhaps hundreds are with them at night. So again, we're asking what we asked in Storm about what these scenes can do, how they link to Blood Raven. Is a little bit of a link to John's chapter and those questions as well. Here, Bran figures they are literally working for Cold Hands, which explains what happened when they saved Sam. So that's interesting and useful, and it seems like a big hint for what Bran could end up doing later with his own unkindness. And yes, I instinctively went to say murder of crows as well, then I remembered they're ravens. I looked it up, and apparently an unkindness of ravens is what the group is called, so there you go, you learned something today, or at least I did. The question still persists whether Cold Hands is doing the controlling, or is it Blood Raven? Either way, they're going to be pretty useful in these woods, and they definitely just serve to bolster up this atmosphere, this creepy atmosphere. Now that he's finished with the roundup, George opts to get back into tension mode as the raven signal that danger is close, close enough for Cold Hands to dismount and want to go and deal with it himself. So we have that tension, which Bran helps out with by telling us that they've been hunted by wolves recently, and given what we've seen in the prologue, we know what a pack of wolves can do, and we definitely do not want to see that happen to Bran and the others. But George rarely just places one thread on an event, so he adds another, sneaky attention in there about Summer not liking Cold Hands, specifically because he smells of cold. We've talked about the smell of cold multiple times in relation to the others. So again, we have to ask exactly what Cold Hands is, why or how he's being kept alive, and how close in nature is to what the others do with their whites versus the fire whites we've seen in the south. These questions keep being raised for our attention. But George keeps the tension wrapped around the now, with the announcement that it's men that are following them, not wolves. We certainly know how dangerous men are, but we want to know, who are they? What are they doing here? Besides, how many times have we seen the protector go off into the night only for his protectees to suffer? So we're getting really worried for Bran and his friends, as Cold Hands hens into the night, even if his confidence about dealing with them 
is also very interesting. Why is he so confident? Why does he think he can take on multiple people? So the children, plus Hodor, are left alone with the elk, summer, and the snow, and they keep on trudging to a village on the lake. Jojen vouches for cold hands, but that just gives Bran another opportunity to think on how much his friend has changed. Mira shows off the same, even if it's to a lesser degree. She's suspicious of cold hands, of this news of pursuers, of everything, really. You can't blame her. Mira doesn't get a tenth of the respect she should as a character. She's out here suffering like the rest of them, often doing more of the work, and she is the one without a power signalling a higher calling or giving her a glimpse of what the future holds. She's acting on trust and faith alone, and she knows if anything does go down with cold hands, she's probably going to have to be the one to deal with it. We lament Jojen's fate and his knowledge of playing a part that ends before the thing is done, but Mira is only inches behind him in that respect. She's given up her life as well. She's starving and freezing. By the end of the book, she might be alive, but we don't have many positive signs for her future. She's given everything for Bran, and is more than worthy of our love. She is a great character. In the here and now, she presents her arguments that perhaps Cold Hands isn't what they hoped him to be. There's the part that would be bad in any part of the world, that he refuses to show his face or give a name, but then there's this extra stuff that Bran admits he's aware of too now that he thinks about it. No eating, no drinking, no bothering of the weather, no sleeping. George is being rather purposeful here as Bran and Mira are knowing exactly what I used to notice about Beric Dondarrion back in Storm. So we again ask questions of the differences and similarities between Ice and Fire Whites. But as the book progresses, we'll also see that Cold Hands has a lot of similarities with a certain priestess currently at Castle Black, so the questions are just multiplying here. Not eating, sleeping or drinking can be explained away in some fashion, or hidden at least, but it's when the group realises that the guy doesn't even breathe that they really start thinking. Just what have they got themselves into here? How do they know this is the right direction? How do they know they aren't in the hands of the enemy already, etc, etc. Old Nan's tales seem a lot more alive now, as if they weren't already as they walked through a frozen forest after passing a crying gate. Yet Bran still tries to be the brave one and keep them going. Cold hands seem to look after Sam and Gilly well enough, so why not us? Though it's coughing Jojen that actually keeps them going by pointing out they really have no other choice. They do it until it's done. Of course later, we're going to focus on what happens to poor Jojen after it is done, but still. So it's the continuation of the idea of Bran sitting at the creepy table and making friends. This is his arena now align with dead things or old things or children of the forest or whomever. The removal from life motif we discussed earlier is really thriving already. Once they arrive at this lake, there's some focus on how the blanketing snow basically hides the lake, how difficult it is to see where the shore is, how it cracks beneath the elk's hooves, and how the trees are tricky because some of them are on islands in the lake, so you think there's land there, but it's actually the surface of the water. You have to think this is George laying the groundwork for Stannis' later stand in the Crofters' village, and the highly regarded theory that he will trick the phrase and maybe some Boltons, into riding over the lake and then into the freezing water. It may well have been that George intended for that to originally appear in Dance with the Battle of Ice, so it makes sense to be placed here. Either way, the foreshadowing works, as many of us believe that is exactly what will happen with Stannis. Much as we like lake talk, the group haven't come upon this village yet. Night is coming, and they are all in a bad way. George checks them off one by one, with Jojen's blue lips and Mira's red cheeks. Hodor is even stumbling, which is the ultimate sign that someone needs to do something. So Bran slips into summer. Not for comfort or curiosity this time, but with a real purpose. And this passage is oh so eerily reminiscent of the beginning of the prologue, with the wet pores and the increased senses. Now, as at the beginning of the chapter, we get that real sense of Bran preferring the life as a wolf, as he once did when he was hiding down in the crypts. His human body is starving and freezing. Summer's body is also starving and freezing, but a little less starving and freezing, as well as that constant thrill of freedom of movement that he's always had, so it makes sense that he likes it. Luckily, he recalls what he's supposed to be doing. He does his scouting and sniffs out this buried village that they need so badly. And note again, the emphasis on the moon as they enter the village. We see that a lot in Bran's pages. The village is pretty much like every other wilding village we've ever seen. It's even comparable to what we saw in the prologue. For all we know, this might have been where Varamir and Fissel were hiding out, although a lake was never mentioned. The key point of this one, though, is that there's no food. They have melted ice to suck on. Score. We know how big starvation is in the rest of this book, but also take note of the early mention of paste, and Jojen's not wanting to have anything to do with it. Yeah, that'll come back to haunt you, but perhaps not as much as his damning line here. Dreams will not sustain you. Not even green dreams. Dreams are what we have. Yeah, that reads pretty sad. Perhaps because Jojen is really saying that's all he's ever going to have. He knows he's not going to taste roast chicken again, so he might as well dream about it. But you can also look at it as a kind of cautionary tale. Soon, Bran will be completely removed from the actual world, stuck in a cave connected to a tree. Soon he'll do nothing but dreaming. So like he must resist the temptation to always live in summer's skin, he must resist only living in dreams or staying in past visions as well. And P.S. Another shout out to Mira here, as Bran details the food situation. 
She's standing in freezing lakes until her lips are blue just to catch them some fish. I cannot overstate how screwed these powerful boys would be without her. And another quick note. Once they do settle down, Hodor rocks back and forth, muttering his name. Is it because he's cold, or because of what Bran has been doing to him? Is it possible that Bran is slowly beating him down mentally with each subsequent walking? Oh, I do hope not. And finally, for this little part here, another quote. These woods are not as empty as you think, he had said. You cannot know what the light might summon from the darkness. I like that as a little bit of an inversion of Melisandre's favourite saying, so there's a tiny little connection between them there as well. It's now that Bran joins Summer on a hunt proper, and George is so intent on drawing comparisons back to the prologue, he almost gives a straight-up replica to the opening line of the book. He was back inside Summer, long leagues away, and the night was rank with the smell of blood. And remember, very, very similar with the rank smell of man back in Rammer's prologue. We keep going with that link because we're about to be connected with the prologue on an even stronger connection due to what Bran and Summer find on their hunt. And it's actually two things, prey and predators. He senses the predators first, and they him, wolf recognising direwolf and vice versa. Then, when Summer comes across the grisly scene, we as re-readers recognise we've already met these predators before. Two males, one female, and one of the males only has a single eye. Yes, hello one eye, short time no see. Here is where Bran also takes note of the prey. Five men, basically torn apart, but let's return to them in a minute after we've dealt with the predators. Summer, who is noted as twice the size of these wolves now despite his hunger, which gives us a pretty cool visual, easily picks out one eye as the leader, the one he'll need to fight. Except when he looks into his eye, Bran surfaces again by realising he's looking at another walk. Now thanks to the fight, Bran doesn't have time to dwell on that, but it's another confirmation of the ability of one walk to recognise another. Importantly, Bran doesn't have an inclination to take one eye from Varamir, or even know that that's possible. He can't even identify who's in there, and thankfully, Varamir has supposedly lost the ability to try and take someone from Bran. Or perhaps he's just too far gone into the mind of the wolf now. It's still a monumental moment. Unlike John, this is the first time Bran has ever come across another walk, apart from his own family members. Either way, after our first wolf-on-wolf -wolf duel, our boy Summer comes out victorious and earns himself a new pack, even with his limp. That's nice of him, Summer deserves some wins too, as long as we're sure Varamir won't try anything sneaky in the future. He's going to keep them around, even when Bran reaches the cave, and I'm interested to see if they figure in the plot in the future. Possibly they'll help fight the Whites if Bran needs to escape, or maybe we'll see reanimated wolves for the first time. I'm not looking forward to that bit so much. Summer earns himself a nice dinner for his efforts, until we remember what the prey actually is. Men. Dead men, but men. And Summer is really enjoying their taste. And who's inside Summer? That's right. And what was that other abomination we learned about in the prologue? Yeah. Oh dear, we're getting a bit close to the line here. Now this isn't technically the rule, but still, it's, uh, it's not great. And all those worries we had about Hodor and how Bran will pay the price of abomination, etc, etc, come flooding back. He's probably not supposed to be doing this. Does it make a difference if they were dead first? At least he didn't kill them and then eat them? Uh, maybe, but we can't be certain. What is of note is that the ravens are watching Summer slash Bran do this. In a moment, Bran will work out is because they were used as the weapon to kill these men, but they might still be cameras for Bloodraven checking off what crimes Bran is getting up to. Let's take a closer look at that prey now, as Bran did before the fight even started. First time readers might have even figured we had come across the party we originally saw killed in the prologue with the baby, until Bran counts off five of them, and more crucially, notes them all as men of the Night's Watch. As the majority of you likely know, it's all but confirmed that these were some of the mutineers back at Craster's Keep, a theory definitely supported by one of them having a hand severed long before this fight. Yes, this is likely Olo Lophand, one of the murderers of Geo Mormon, essentially, and all around a pretty bad guy. He's the mutineer, he's done some terrible things at Craster's Keep, I don't think we need to guess about that. So that's fun that we see that he's died. We get some justice in these awful men getting their comeuppance, but again, it's not so pretty to look upon when you actually see it. And the other key detail, their eyes are gone. Hmm. Now the Weeper does the same thing, he takes eyes, and Mormont's Raven ate his face and presumably his eyes. So is there something to that? Is that some way to protect against reanimation or ward it off in some way? The faceless men deal with faces and they have a thing about eyes, so there may well be a connection. After all, every time we see a white, it's their eyes being blue that really sticks out to us. Hmm. We also get these lines about thousand eyes and one. We've got one eye the wolf. Yeah, these kind of things tend to grab at you when reading George's work. Bran will again bring up the identities of these men and their missing eyes in a moment, but before he leaves Summer, who is pretty proud of his new pack, Bran reminds him that they already had a pack. Lev lost a member, perhaps even two. A little bit of a fist pump there, breathing a little more life into the Greywind theories, but three still definitely remain. We must remember them, Bran seems to tell Summer, with a particular emphasis on Ghost. Hmm, yeah, we're really shoring up the Bran-John connection here. But we did have a lot 
in the early books. Remember John's early visions of Bran and Clash and uh, and seeing his brother's face in the Weirwood Tree and stuff like that. We've left that a little bit recently, but it seems to be coming back strong here. I wonder why. Now, we'll save that talk for another day, but it is going to be important. When he returns to his old body, it's to find cold hands also returned and a pig being cooked up by Mira. Hmm, a random pig in these snowy conditions where they've struggled to find any game whatsoever. Okay, Bran doesn't actually focus on this point very much, but we probably should for him. Maybe Cold Hands did find a pig. Or maybe he carved up one of these men he killed and offered his meat up instead. Isn't human meat supposed to taste like pork? I think so. A lot of people run with this idea now, and it definitely fits in thematically. It's another abomination crime crossed off the list. We definitely can't use the excuse of being in summer now. Is another base crime committed. And it fits in with Aya also eating human meat. It explain why George focuses on each of the others eating their own. Hodor has it in his beard, etc, etc. So are they now all cursed despite their innocence? Does that still count? Again, is this something that Bloodraven requires for Bran? Is it getting him ready for Jojen pace perhaps? We don't know, but it's pretty damning either way. It's another barrier broken because Bran eats the meat. We question back in Varamir's prologue whether he can be held responsible for this. He didn't know. He didn't do the killing himself. And he's starving. He actually does need it. I don't know if that matters. We know this is happening with the knowledge of Blood Raven, thanks to his little cameras. So does he know that Bran is breaking taboos, but feels it a necessary evil? Or is he just doing a spit in the eye of gods type thing? Hmm. It's so soon after Vaomir to get us worried about Bran's soul in terms of another abomination rule. Unfortunately, it's not going to be the last. Again, entering into that world of the dead and the bad and the creepy. Maybe it's all just a requirement to enhance his powers. Maybe this is just the bottom line, it needs to be done. We really can't say, we really can't pass judgment on it. Could we say, oh, okay, well, that's okay if he needs it for his powers, eat as much human meat as you like, fill your bowl with Jojen paste? I don't think we would, so it's pretty complex. But Bran is not thinking about any of that. He's thinking back to the men with the wolves, specifically what they were wearing and how they died. Here's his quote. You killed them. You and the ravens. Their faces were all torn and their eyes were gone. Cold hands did not deny it. They were your brothers. I saw. And this is an important point. Bran is pointing out that Cold Hands has broken the ultimate rule of the Night's Watch. I assume it's the ultimate rule. They never actually focused on it, to be honest. Killing another man of the Night's Watch. They are brothers. They are sworn in as family. So Bran is trying to angle this as an act of the Kinslayer curse, essentially. On top of that, his stark blood is kicking in, as he inherently moves to protect the Night's Watch, as I did and Bravos. That's how they were raised. That's what they've always been told. This is the legacy of Eddard Stark proving through. That's even ignoring the fact that two close family members were, slash are, men of the Night's Watch. Starks protect the Night's Watch, and they deal justice to those who break the vows. So this realisation, as much as anything, sparks Bran into demanding to know who Cold Hands is and what's his deal. And Cold Hands' matter-of-fact response about congealing blood and extremities is interesting. It's so straightforward, and with him looking like he's forgotten it's an issue, it really, really reminds us of Beric. Perhaps Cold Hands is just what Beric would have ended up like if he had gone on unliving for longer. Maybe that's what we'll see of Stoneheart eventually. Maybe it might even be what we see of John in the end. Mira demands to see his face. Cold hands refuses, so Bran finally names him dead, an evil monster they can't trust, and Mira wants to know about his boss. Who is this three-eyed crow? A friend, dreamer, wizard, call him what you will. The last green seer. Well, that sounds cool. It's also interesting because what does that make Bran? Well, he was going to be the last green seer. The Raven seem to agree with both Coldhand's statement and Bran's calling him a monster. But as with earlier, Jojen delivers the final verdict. They go with him, or they die. This is all they have, a world of monsters. A world that Bran might be joining in more ways than one. Now, like I said earlier, seeing as he finishes the chapter off for us here, let's give some more focus to Jojen and the sad note at the end, the whole chapter really, that it is for him. He was the pusher before. The pusher of Bran experimenting with his gifts and of moving north, and basically the herald of destiny. That's a role we're used to seeing in fantasy series, but we don't normally get to see them as we see Jojen here. A boy used up by destiny, who has almost fulfilled his role and will soon have his usefulness ended. We spoke of this a bit in Storm as they travelled further and further north, but Jojen's story in Dance is truly fascinating as a study of these secondary or even tertiary characters in a grand epic. He's the boy who might have dreamed of being the hero in his youth, who doesn't, but instead discovered he was a sideline man, a means to an end. So what comes after that purpose is solved? In most stories, he'd just be left behind and would disappear. But George, as always, wants to show the other side. He wants to show a little more. A little boy whose life has lost all purpose. He's now to simply wait and waste away and watch someone else serve the world. He was a tool, and that's it. 
That's a really hard thing to get your head around at any age. And regardless if you're called little grandfather for being wise, which is interesting since Jojen is about as opposite a character as you can get from Barristan or Sir Grandfather, it was difficult enough while actually in the action of delivering Bran North, but now the end of this part is nearing and we'll see it end. And then he feels into a real melancholy. That's without the added possibility of Jojen paste. That's not actually been confirmed for us, but a lot of the fandom will take that idea as fact by now. So let's do the same. Let's take it as fact for a moment. Let's say he does die. That means Jojen's last days are either filled with wasted purpose and deep sadness, or even worse, he always knew that becoming Jojen Paste was his eventual destiny. Which makes this whole book and what he's doing now a thousand times worse. In the beginning, he could maybe persuade himself he's part of a big story, he's going to contribute to the empowerment of the ultimate hero, perhaps Blood Raven or the old gods are selling him on this point, we don't know if that's true or lie or whatever. But then, as you near that actual reality, you realise you've put your sister through hell, only to leave her, you realise that that's not all it's cracked up to be, and you're not even going to be around to see the end of it, you realise you're going to die, and that you were just a bit player. He's played his part, and now he's spent. Like I say, he's been used like a tool by fate or the weirwoods or blood raven or whatever, and now they have no more use for him. It's great George stuff again. The character doesn't just disappear after helping the hero, he has his own problems and life to consider. Everything is so 3D, everything is so layered from George. It's amazing for us to read, it's terrible for Jojen as an existence to bear on his shoulders. So, great night to finish on. There's a lot of atmosphere and none of it too light or cheery. These people are cold, they're hungry, winter is here in full force, and they're forced to deal with monsters. This is the world of Bran Stark now, even ignoring his potential abominations and crimes, and it seems his friends are going to pay the price for getting him where he needs to go. Maybe we can even draw up some light comparisons to Quentin and his also being on a quest where his friends have to pay the price a lot of the time. We super, super need to find out the true reason for why they're going through this and how it's hopefully worth it. Mira, Jojen, and Hodor are about as lovable a bunch as you could find, so George knows what he's doing, by punishing them to get our heartstrings going. And already, we're at a, a little juncture here in the book, something we haven't come across. After those first three chapters, Tyrion, John, Daenerys, we have double digits remaining for all three of them. We have plus 10 chapters afterwards. Now, after this brand one, we only get to see him come up twice more. That's it. We have two more brand chapters left of this series. It's a little bit mind boggling. So we look forward to that. But that one is brand one. That's one third of Bran's dance arc done. Let's move on to a very, very, very different setting now, to Tyrion 2. See you later, Pentos. We're gone. Will we see you again? Eh, probably. There's so much setup that must be followed in some way, with the Tattered Prince and Illyrio himself. I suppose that doesn't necessarily have to happen in Pentos, but that really doesn't seem that it was originally planned that way. Who knows? Daenerys does have to come back that direction. Is she going to go that far north? We, who knows? But possibly. So Bran, he kicked off the travel chapters, but Tyrion is the one really running with them. And it's better than being in a cask, isn't it? Now I said bye to Pentos, but not to Illyro. He's going to remain with us here in this chapter to guide Tyrion into this new area of the world that we've not explored at all yet. So we know Tyrion is on the move and going to lands unknown. We can be confident that's going to be memorable. But what's the purpose of this particular chapter? We had a hint in Tyrion 1, but this is the big unveiling of the original big plan of meeting Daenerys in Volantis, of combining Fae Kagon, Young Griff, with Dan together, although we don't actually get told that yet, and wow, what a force that would be. Like I say, Tyrion doesn't know that aspect just yet, but he's focusing on Daenerys the same way that the first time reader is. Tyrion is too smart to fall for propaganda and just a single recommendation. So again, we will see his old self come out as he tries to figure out the reason Illyrio would do any of this, and we have to ask the same questions along with him. Yes, old Tyrion is in there somewhere, we can see it, even if he can't escape his new mood. So let's get to it. The last chapter was all travel, like we said, and this one is too. Early chapter sequencing, we like it. Except the climate and terrain really couldn't be any more different. The Exton Gate of Pentos is even named after the sunrise, just to really rub it in. The sunrise gate sounds very jolly, doesn't it? What better to describe a journey eastward? Well, I'm assuming the gate is on the east side of Pentos. What better gate to head to Daenerys via? She serves as the sunrise in this story, doesn't she? But Tyrion doesn't get to experience any of that because he's being hidden away again. At least not in a cask, but as Illyrio states, the idea is that Tyrion's existence, and thereby mission, is secret. Grand as he made it seem before, Illyrio first needs Tyrion not to be taken and kidnapped on the road, and then sent back to King's Landing, and he also doesn't need Cersei probably dropping everything going on at home and sending an army to Pentos if word gets out he was housing her brother. At least this part of the journey is a little bit more familiar to Tyrion. In the litter, perhaps the last vestige of his old life that he'll get in this book. Early on, Illyrio is probably right about the dangers of the sea. We know there's a whole bunch going on in the narrow sea right now, but he's also providing great foreshadowing what will happen to Tyrion when he finally does get on a proper sea boat. 
not just Tyrion, in fact, plenty of characters will suffer from storms in this book. Not satisfied with one bunch of foreshadowing, we also have our first mention of the Stone Men, who might have figured as a bigger part of the story when this was first written with the Shrouded Lord cut that we all know about, though it's plenty important still for John Connington. The pair suggest we leave that talk behind and focus on the few little comforts left to them. Ilio is going to remain with those, but he knows that Tyrion won't. Though he'll wait until the end of the chapter, Tyrion is still going to focus on death, if not disease, as Ilio suggests that they don't anymore. But for now, he will take up Ilio's offer of basically having a bit of a chat and enjoying the finer things in life. After some extra descriptions of these comforts and Ilio confirming he's going to be returning to Pentos to smooth the way for Daenerys' return, I'm sure a part of this is genuine, but I wonder if some of it's just self-preservation and getting back to his walled manse instead of heading into danger. We get Tyrion becoming bored of waiting and demanding to know what Ilio is going to gain in all of this. Why bother? Ilio's first charge, his first claim, is that he's simply basically a philanthropist trying to change the world for the better and help this random woman gain happiness and justice. Ah, oh, good job, Ilio. You're a hero. I'm pretty sure this attempt wouldn't even work on Hot Pie. It's definitely not going to work on the most cynical version of Tyrion we ever see. Tyrion says, Next you'll be offering me a suit of magic armour and a palace in Valeria. That's his response. Uh, well, I'm going to doubt we'll be seeing any Valerian palaces anytime soon, but I do adore any reference to suits of magical armour because I really want to see that Valerian steel armour that might turn up with Euron or maybe elsewhere. And since Tyrion happens to be including it in the same sentence as Valeria, I wonder if we'll look back on this as some very, very subtle foreshadowing. It's interesting that when Ilio defends Daenerys against the assumption she is too weak for the Iron Throne, he brings up the blood of the dragon, a reasoning he's clearly going to be using for young Griff when the time comes as well. In keeping with the themes of the book, both when looking at Daenerys herself and to the comparison between her and young Griff, Tyrion notes that plenty of terrible rulers come from that bloodline, that family too. Blood does not guarantee imitation or success. Either way, he asks for the backstory of Daenerys and Ilio's past with her, which is delivered with yet more evidence of Ilio being a horrible little so-and-so. It's always good to be reminded of his true nature, the fact that he wanted Charles Daenerys for himself so much he had to take his sexual frustrations out on one of his slaves. Oh, poor Ilio, he's so hard done by. We've really, really got to hope that Danny doesn't actually have to be an ally with this guy in any way, shape or form down the road. Oh, and don't forget, on top of that, he figured that she would presumably just be raped to death by the horse lord soon enough, so there's no point getting too invested in her, is there? And he was totally fine with that, because he was preoccupied with putting Viserys in power. A Viserys that Ilya admits here was vain and greedy and definitely the son of the Mad King. So that should serve as an early hint to Tyrion that presenting Westeros with the correct ruler wasn't slash isn't Ilya's first intention, because he was fully prepared to send Viserys over there to begin with. According to this tale, he just lucked into discovering Daenerys was much better suited. So his first claim of just wanting to help her has already been debunked and hints at a different motive entirely, which we'll find out about. As if this talk of Daenerys being thought of in such a way isn't enough to annoy us completely, we also find out Viserys had fully intended to rape Daenerys before she was sold to Khal Drogo, so her miserable existence would have been far, far worse. Again, Ilio seems to think he deserves some credit for sparing her from this fate, even though we know, at this point, it was probably more of a mix between not wanting his deals and plans to fall through with the Dothraki, and also some jealousy over the fact he didn't get to bed her either. What a pair those two really did make, Ilio and Viserys. Hmm. Ilio completes the next part of Danny's tale post-birth of the dragons before reminding us of the current mission they are headed towards, meeting Danny in Volantis. So we've got some more chapter sequencing in this big build-up of Volantis obviously being a key part in many plans here at the beginning, which is great because we're going to go there in our next chapter of Quentin. Remember also that first-time readers might still be hoping we do genuinely see Daenerys depart Marine and get into Volantis within these pages. We've only had one Danny chapter to persuade us otherwise so far. It's all a splendid tale of Daenerys and Slaver's Bay and the dragons and everything else, but Tyrion again has to ask why. The question hasn't been answered. What is in it for Illyro? Who's holding the strings here? A lifetime around Tywin is enough to give you that mindset, but especially discovering that most of your life has always been a lie, and you've always been dancing on those strings he said so before in Storm. So Tyrion really wants to see who has laid a path for Danny and why. Just tell me why. That's the important question, because if he can see that, he can see how he's going to be played. He doesn't want to be a piece again. He's had quite enough of that life. Thank you. So next, Ilio says it's just purely for money and a castle as well. Standard answer, and true in hundreds of cases throughout history. But this is really going above the call just for some extra coin and a new home. Especially when Ilio already has so much money anyway, he's already got this nice big manse. And Tyrion has just shrewdly noted how doing this would be counterproductive for both him and the rulers of Volantis, thanks to their involvement in the slave trade that Daenerys is abolishing. So our big brain, our favourite Tyrion, he's definitely making a return. 
If I were to guess, I'd say Illyro considers Danny's views on slavery as more of a trifling fancy, something for a young girl to amuse herself with on the different part of the world while she's growing into herself, etc., etc., but something that she can be steered away from. Once she's back under control, she's back with him, with young Griff as he's planning, and has the smell of Westeros in her nostrils. He's just considering, okay, let her do that for a bit, you know, mess up things for a while, but then I'll get her out of the way and we can return to how things normally are. It's also important to establish that Ilio is presenting it as a road to Danny now. His little hint at the end of Tyrion 1 was left ambiguous enough for our discussion as rereaders, even though first-timers would have assumed he was focused on Daenerys from the first place. But now she really is being put up as the front, as the interest for Tyrion. So Tyrion has questions about Ilio's motivations, as we've seen, and so do we. Why is it he wants Danny to have Tyrion? That's another important question. Is it as a bargaining chip, as genuine good counsel for the invasion to come, as another connection to a big Westerosi name that might garner some support somewhere in the homelands, or perhaps even as a gift to get back into her good books, as Brown Ben Plum and Jorah Mormont will attempt later on? Or is it that he wants young Griff to have Tyrion in some degree also, to teach the lad a little bit more about recent Westerosi news that his other boat chums can't? We'll come back to that thinking in a moment. Illyrio's intentions are still a bit mystical even after having read the book, but clearly at this moment he still believes the idea is to have a Danny, Fae Aegon, Young Griff combo take Westeros. So Tyrion is supposed to be with the both of them anyway, which leads me both to the fact he wants to keep Young Griff a secret until the Golden Company are secured and Daenerys is in hand, as well as knowing Tyrion would be more invested in one over the other. This is how he thinks, okay, I can get this guy on board by presenting Daenerys first. And all that makes me wonder if Ilio actually resents Daenerys beneath all his manners. She is going to take half the limelight of Young Griff's return to Westeros if that was indeed what was supposed to happen. She messed up his original plan for Viserys, she denied him when she went to Slaver's Bay, she hasn't responded to his offers etc. So I'm wondering what his actual feelings are about her, beyond what we know of she's just a piece a means to an end and he doesn't actually care about her at all. Now going back to what he claims he's going to get out of it, he specifically mentions being named Master of Coin and being given his choice in castles. I doubt very much Viserys ever named Casterly Rock precisely, and Eero is more using that as an example to prick at Tyrion and get under his skin. But the Master of Coin option is an interesting one. From what we've seen, the role of Master of Coin is not intended to make the actual master any richer, that's not supposed to be the point. Tyrion certainly didn't see any extra income. Peter Baelish did, but only because he orchestrated the best cookbooks operation in history, and Illo, well, he would likely plan to do the same, wouldn't he? In a moment, Tyrion will sniff out this reasoning also doesn't make much sense given Illo's current wealth. But there is something to be said of the idea that Illo wanted to be on a small council with Varys at the same time. Varys controls the information and the whisperers, Illyro controls the money. Well, in a couple of pages' time, we'll learn that was the exact game they played growing up, so did they intend to start that again? Come back to the idea after we've talked about their past. Ilio is just a bit too indifferent to the idea that Danny will either pay what was promised, even though she didn't do any promising herself, or won't. That's a huge sign that his investment is in something else, as Tyrion says it here, and that he likely doesn't think Danny will be in charge anyway once she meets with young Griff and he gets his hand on one or more of the dragons. It boils me up to think how Ilio plans to sweep her aside after all she's done and earned. He is betting he never gets the chance. But he is quite willing to sacrifice hundreds, in reality thousands of Danny's people, for her to march on Volantis. In fairness, he doesn't have quite a clear picture of just how many people she has following her now with the freedmen, etc. But clearly, he's in favour of collateral damage as long as it's aimed at the lower classes. He sounds a lot like Jorah here. Like in Tyrion 1, we get some signs of the old Tyrion as we hinted at the beginning. He's got knowledge on how Volantis works even though he's never been required to learn for any reason and figures that something doesn't quite add up. Next, we get the most exposition on Varys and Illyro's background that we'll probably ever get. It's very interesting and is very well timed for a book where we learn the biggest single key facts about them in terms of allegiance and ultimate end goals. It also lines up very well as a follow-on from what Varys told Tyrion back in Clash, so we can assume the general idea is true even if all the details are maybe a bit murky. Then again, having a rehearsed backstory sounds exactly like something these two boys would have come up with, so who can say? In general, it's a pretty interesting story. I won't relate it all to you here now, but it's pretty good. And I bet George would actually love to write some of those up properly, if only he had the time. But we do get some key notes out of it. We learn that the statue we saw in Tyrion 1 back in uh, Illyro's mansion was supposedly of Illyro at 16, which makes it all the more interesting that we originally compared it to a young Griff type, given the theories that the boy might be Illyro's son, or kin at least. That, and that Father Time apparently really does take its toll, because... Ilio does not look like that statue anymore. He also mentions that he was a bravo. Now, I'm, I'm confused. One of you might be able to help me out here. Does that mean he originally came from Bravos? Are all bravos bravosi, or is it just a description of it as a kind of occupation type thing? As it's another interesting connection, if so, will we ever explore that further? 
that Ilio maybe came from Bravos. Very, very interesting. We also get this very cool explanation of how the idea of little birds came to be, how the two boys concocted this scheme and built a network, but also a friendship that's lasted 20, maybe 30 years after the fact, which isn't exactly a common occurrence in these pages. For two people to be loyal to each other for that long, definitely not the norm. There is the wisdom of chasing secrets and information over gold that seemed to vault the boys into a new tier, and also seems to have been more of Varys's area, more of his idea. It very much seems that Varys was the brains and the talent, Illyro was more of the financier and a public face, and maybe a bit of the muscle as well. Still, it got him a cushy wedding, and it got Varys across the narrow sea, so we can't argue with results, although we can delve a bit further into why Varys would want to go across the narrow sea. Hmm, hmm, that's a later discussion. We can't really take it all at face value. We don't know what's true and what's not with these guys. I mean, that is their mission statement, isn't it? If it is all correct, what it doesn't explain is why both Varys and Illyro are so tied into the Blackfires or Targaryens at least. It seems like it would be a huge coincidence if they'd just bumped into each other with almost exact personal histories. Or is Illyro the one of the history and Varys is just really brought into what his friend desires, along with genuinely thinking it's best for the realm? Or is he related to the Blackfires as well? Again, we don't know. These are the tough questions that hopefully we'll get more information on later, but we just can't trust what they're saying, can we? With Tyrion seemingly more satisfied with that answer than he was with the one about Elio's ambitions, and with the both of them kind of acknowledging the other as an intelligent schemer here, they kind of take a minute to give a nod, okay, I see you, you see me, Tyrion takes some time to think of his personal connections to dragons throughout his life and his childhood. We've had these little recalls sprinkled throughout the series, even if they've been nothing but fanciful memories to Tyrion. But now, they're real. We saw him before, he used to think about books that he could find. We saw when he found the dragon skulls, etc, etc. But that's nothing compared to now. Now, they actually exist and he's going towards them. All those dreams that he just dismissed as dreams are now actually possible. The temptation, therefore, is very, very real here. He might frame it as wishing that he could see his father deal with this seemingly unstoppable force, and that would have been very fun to see, that would have been cool to see how Tywin screws that up as well. But you can see that Tyrion is toying with the idea of wielding the ultimate power himself. Physical presence has always been what he believes he's lacked. It's obviously a very, very big part of his personality. Everything would come easy if he could wield a sword or just stand tall. He once told Sansa that in the dark, he was the same as the Knight of Flowers. Now, he meant several things by that, but one of them was his idea that it doesn't matter how tall you are when you're lying down. And it also doesn't matter when you're sat on the back of a dragon. We can see this in the following quote. The Mad King's daughter had hatched three living dragons, two more than even a Targaryen should require, Tyrion thought. That's pretty damn telling, isn't it? It doesn't leave a lot of room for doubt in what you'd like. His despair and nihilism haven't gone anywhere, but the idea of not just equalising himself with all the tall men, but jumping high above them, would be a tasty idea at the best of times, never mind when you believe there are countless scores to settle. So that's definitely something to keep an eye on. It doesn't come up too much more in this book, because Tyrion kind of takes a bad path, but when he gets closer and closer to those dragons, and maybe finds himself back in a position of power or control, keep an eye out for that, definitely. After drifting off and then waking, Tyrion has some minor thoughts about the Valerian roads that will pop up in importance later in the book, and assuredly in winds or spring, when Danny finally has to move her forces west. We're hoping it's winds, but I don't want to jinx it. In a minute, when he gets out to have a look, we'll see that these few stone roads with room for rain runoff are essentially an engineering marvel in this world. Surely they'll get a chance to prove their worth at some point. He also ponders why Aegon and his ancestors never troubled Westeros before they did, Aegon the First we're talking about here obviously, which perhaps shows some underestimating of those early Targaryens and the worth of Dragonstone, who really cast it off, but they obviously liked it. He also mentions a dream of Daenerys mistaking Tyrion for Jaime and having him fed to a dragon. I wonder if there is a shade of foreshadowing in this. Not in the mistaken Tyrion for Jaime, I don't think any of us are expecting that, but in her feeding Jaime to a dragon. We would hope that by the time Danny and Jaime cross paths, she will have learnt enough about her father to not blame Jaime too harshly, but it's hardly a sure bet. And it's quite possible that she has never told of the wildfire facet or what Jamie was actually asked to do by her father. So I could foresee Danny using this as an example to show Restoros that she means to be a just ruler and that the previous regime of the Lannisters is truly over. Perhaps Tyrion's tale will motivate her of, uh, of what's happened with Tysha, etc. Perhaps, in fact I would say it's likely, this occurs after Jamie has killed Cersei and Danny also sends him as a kinslayer slash possible queenslayer to his list of crimes. It would certainly make thematic sense for the man who essentially ended dragon presence on Westeros to now being eaten by one. 
and for Jamie to finally pay a price for the crime that completely shaped his life. Now, we all agree, killing Ares was not really a crime, and in fact, a massively heroic act. But the larger world, and sometimes even Jamie himself, do not see it that way. It'd be some incredible writing to see him have to pay for those past crimes. For all we know, Danny does this after meeting John, and maybe they learn about Bran as well. It's all incredibly interesting, just coming from an offhanded comment about a dream. Illyro also has some further confirmations about Tyrion being sent to Daenerys because he's intelligent and cunning, which plays off with that game recognised game moment we had a second ago. But Illyro does seem genuine in this regard. He believes Tyrion will be of use. Now, is he being genuine in who he wants to eventually benefit from this in terms of Aegon? Perhaps not, but the thinking checks out. Daenerys either has the non-cunning or the non-trustworthy around her. Aegon has Griff, true, but there's limits to his playing of the game, and Illyro probably wouldn't mind weaning Aegon off dependence on his fake father either. Besides, if it all goes wrong and it turns out Danny does want to kill Tyrion because of his family name, it's still a plus one in Illyro's column for proving loyalty. Here's the next quote from Tyrion. Are you down in some hell, father? A nice cold hell where you can look up and see me help restore Mad Aerys' daughter to the Iron Throne. So we can see Tyrion is absolutely in the mindset where he'd change the direction of his entire life, cross the world, and take part in an invasion that will kill thousands while changing the course of history just because it's another dig at his father, an extra painful one. And in that, we can see that Elio also has to do very little persuading, really. Tyrion is talking himself into it. Elio's hope that by now, Danny will have left Marine is another good meta comment for what we all would have wanted if we were given the option, but also yet yeah, another example of how all these plans of Elio and Varys are just based on way too many human emotional variables to ever really come up with a proper conclusion, as well as being another of those smug reader moments where we know the truth and they don't. It's quite fun to see how confident Elio is in his incorrect assessment. He's convinced she will be where she's supposed to be. He even says that plans may need to be adjusted once they get there, but he obviously has no idea just how much, or that he's providing the spark in Tyrion that will change the plan completely, irreversibly you might say. I think what he and Varys actually get at the end is damn lucky in terms of young Griff and Jon Con arriving at Storm's End and kind of going from there. That's pretty lucky they get that far, even if it's nowhere near their original plan. The third and final irony is that by the time Tyrion and the other Danny Arrows actually arrive at the place that she is, even though it's not where she's supposed to be in Marine, she is indeed left, just in the wrong direction. Here is where we also get that first mention of Griff, so you can see how much information George is packing into a chapter that is really just Tyrion and Elio riding through the countryside. We don't know who he is, Griff I mean, or what role he's going to play, only that he is going to be semi in charge of getting Tyrion to where he needs to go, and is part of this larger plan of getting Daenerys west with the dragons. Of course, our minds work overtime as soon as Ilio mentions he is Westerosi, as we always figure it'll be someone we know, or someone connected to someone we know, but as of now, we aren't given enough information. Tyrion will save working out that truth for his next chapter. But he is already setting up that he will not trust Griff, that perhaps Ilio shouldn't, and that this will be someone worth paying attention to. Talking of Griff, points Ilio to bring up the Golden Company and the fact they are also involved. So everything is getting very serious very quickly here. This is no small plan here. This is involving a lot of people, some very large moving parts. And we're making some early connections to Feast with this Golden Company info. We'd already heard about this in the previous book, but hadn't been given the context. And now it all makes much more sense of why George kept telling us about them. We really couldn't figure it out back then. Now it's a bit clearer. We know Danny could do with some more allies, there's the possibility for Tyrion to get involved as well, and we might suspect Illyro's intention, but it's just tough not to be excited for Daenerys as a first timer. Everything does seem to be finally moving towards getting her to Westeros, and that's before we get to the next chapter of Quentin, which seems like another possibility of making an ally in Dawn, so everything is really looking up for Daenerys, we think, as opposed to her actual chapter where we found her. Now that's as a first time reader obviously, the rereaders is a lot of fun to see how their early inclusion, the Golden Company, knowing that Tyrion will ultimately influence their entire fate without ever even meeting them. Tyrion also gives us a quick refresher on the Golden Company's history and their philosophy, with Illyro commenting, Some contracts are written in ink, and some in blood, I say no more. So we instantly know there is something beyond the usual going on here, something special that breaks the normal operating systems of the Golden Company, but what is it? That is what leads Tyrion to thinking back on the Blackfire history of the Golden Company and questioning why they had turned to the opposite side of a dragon coin after centuries of fighting against it. Again, Ilio is a bit too quick in his dismissal, claiming it's just been so long that they merely want to go home, and Danny can provide that. She very much shares in the idea of healing old wounds and returning home that Tyrion also shares in, and they can still fight for the only dragon blood that remains in the world. Okay, so that makes sense. Luckily for Illyro, this kind of vengeful, violent return, like I say, fits right into Tyrion's own situation. So the questioning doesn't go too much further because he gets wrapped up in his own family issues. But for us readers, 
we absolutely do have to question. This ties in far too neatly to the possibility of young Griff Agen actually being a blackfire, or at least being presented as one. So re-readers really have to kind of slaver over this point of what the Golden Company actually believe is going on, or believed initially anyway. There's so much unforeseen influence that happens in this book, it's really hard to tell. Regardless, we're finally beginning to see the payoff of all this huge building of Blackfire information and themes that George slowly introduced to the series as we went, including everything we have from Duncan Egg, from the World Book, and soon Fire and Blood Volume 2. You know, we're going to get a lot of that. Whatever the truth of the matter, the duality of dragons is going to be a huge part of the narrative going forward. Again, the clue's in the name of the book. And here it is finally touching the story proper. Red or black, is what Ilio says. A dragon is a dragon. We've already talked about this a lot in the prepper episode, that this is the book presenting this new Targaryen era or generation and the two sides of one dynasty possibly at war with each other again. We can look forward and maybe think if young Griff is a Blackfire, could he marry Danny? Is it possible that that makes them have a child or something and that would be a grand healing and the unification of these two sides into one amazing dynasty? But I think most of us agree there's like a 1% chance of that happening. Much more likely, we're looking again to the dance another dance even though that's confusing obviously because the dance was an entirely different uh concept than the blackfire rebellions that was reds and blacks not greens and blacks but still it's much the same thing the general idea is there is further conflict for daenerys even if she does come west yes we're setting up dawn as possible and what Tyrion will give her and maybe she does gain the golden company but there is a rift to consider and it's probably going to get wider and wider Obviously, we know thanks to Tyrion, this book really sets them on different paths. They're probably going to clash again at some point. I know we're all very much looking forward to seeing that in wins. Of course, that's just brilliant George in setting those seeds like we talked about. They are worth something now. They're going to be worth quite a lot probably in wins and beyond. When the conversation is done and Ilio once again falls asleep, Tyrion gives some thought to Barrett and Selmy, potentially going to war alongside those he once thought of enemies. Tyrion thinks, rebellion makes for queer bedfellows and he's right in that as we're only going to see more and more new connections and teammates made even in this early stage of danny's invasion there might also be some subtle foreshadowing to the theorized portrayal of barris and selmy in regards to daenerys that he will ride with the enemy or perhaps an enemy even sooner than we'd think next up is andalos the ancestral home of the majority of characters we ever meet aside from the northerners alas andalos unfortunately we hardly knew ye. We basically passed right through. We don't really get to see a lot. Although, more than we ever get of Lys or Torosh, so can't complain. Despite this being a relatively large part of Western Essos and a very quick history lesson we get from Illyro here, we're really not going to linger. This land's connection with the Seven has Tyrion reminding us that he once dreamed of being the High Septon, which inevitably leads him to thinking about Tysha, because obviously they were married by a Septon. Luckily, this time around there is something to distract him for at least a little while from despairing about her as Illyro busts out a little painting of his former love, Sarah. Before we dive further into the Sarah tale, something that always sticks out to me is this little locket. Is this the only time we see a painted likeness of someone in the series? We have statues galore and sometimes tapestries, although they don't seem as detailed as their real life counterparts, but I don't remember ever hearing about portraits or paintings. Yet here we have this, so it always just sticks out to me. Correct me if I'm wrong, I normally am, but point that out because I can't think of one. But back to Sarah herself. Surprise, surprise, she was a slave that Ilio took a particular liking to. Now, did Sarah love him back? Who can say? We're probably never going to find out. I doubt she had much choice in the matter. Ilio actually seems to give himself a bit of a pat on the back for deigning to marry someone so low in society after previously wedding a prince's cousin, almost as if he's performed some great act of charity. It seems his feelings for her were false enough to shun royalty, but again, we've got no idea if that was reciprocated and how much of this is actually true. Either way, the point is, Ido's just an awful person. But what's of more interest is what comes next. Sarah died from the grey death that was brought in via a ship at port. Now this seems a throwaway line that is easy to miss, but remember that the grey death is what Val and others call grayscale, and also remember how explosive that she is in telling John, this is much later in the book, that Shireen is dangerous because of it. This is all very, very relevant because, of course, later on, John Connington slash Old Griff is going to contract the sickness, the Grey Death, and he's going to sail right onto Westeros without letting anyone else know he's got it. He'll be around big camps full of men, men who might spend their time with camp followers and fighting with others in close quarters, and he'll be meeting some important people himself too. So more than a few fans have theorised that a new plague of Grayscale will sweep through the Seven Kingdoms, because why not chuck another log on the fire? It makes sense with Ilio pointing out how devastating it can be here, 
We get a few examples in Fire and Blood of similar diseases laying waste to the Seven Kingdoms, and it's being placed as important setup for later on. So very, very important stuff. Keep that in the back of your mind. The presence of Sarah also adds to the discussion that perhaps this is the true mother of Aegon, hence Ido's lifelong desire to do right by her. But it's really conjecture. We don't know, do we? It is just very, very useful for theory crafting at the end of the book, to be honest. Although Tyrion reacts by turning the conversation back to the land that they are crossing, of which Ilio is also pretty dismissive. He really does play the rich, uncaring landowner who really likes his walls very, very much, but he does start to discuss the Dothraki a bit, with Ilio giving Tyrion lessons of how things are done in Essos. These are lessons that we learned long ago beside Daenerys, of the gift-giving rituals and the symbiosis of the different parties of Essos and what's been achieved here most of it being based unfortunately on slavery. I point it out because Tyrion responds with a teaching straight out of the Tywin Lannister Academy. If you destroy one Kalasar, maybe it teaches the other Dothraki not to bother again. That's very, very Tywin in thinking, and a good reminder that Tyrion has never seen a Kalasar and has no idea what he's talking about. Here's another quote that's included here, but links back to what we were saying a few minutes ago. It's from Illyro. Griff is different. He has a son he dotes on. Young Griff, the boy is called. There never was a nobler lad. Yeah, so there we go, there it is. It's another throwaway line, but one that becomes very, very much studied after having read some more of the book. The rhythm of the chapter stays constant as the two travelling companions again fall asleep. This time, Tyrion has an interesting dream of a bloody return to Westeros, where he fights beside Barry, Bitter Steel, and the dragons, and he ends up killing Jamie as one of his two heads weep. The Jamie stuff is pretty easy to figure out. A part of him loves his brother and would hurt to see him die. But do we see foreshadowing in the rest? It's perfectly possible that Tyrion fights alongside Barry. Bit of Steel would likely mean the Golden Company, although it's hard to imagine them being on the same side, unless Tyrion also portrays Daenerys next to Barry. Or perhaps this is just him becoming giddy at the prospect of being able to return and deal revenge as these other parties also wish. When he wakes, they are finally approaching the river, the Little Roin, which will obviously connect to the much larger river later on. Tyrion makes an astute observation, as he often does. I'll quote it for you here. Gohandroi had been a Roinar city, until the dragons of Valeria had reduced it to a smouldering desolation. I am travelling through years as well as leagues, Tyrion reflected, back through history to the days when dragons ruled the earth. And that is dead on and a definite choice by George. Let's hammer down as many dragon themes as we can in this book that's named after them. Again, Tyrion sleeps and wakes, sleeps and wakes. He sees a lake that Ilio unknowingly links to squisher theories, standing stones apparently raised by giants who knew they made it this far. And the singular sphinx that we have mentioned in previous feast episodes, the one with a dragon's body and a woman's face. As Tyrion notes, that's a pretty fitting sign, although Ilio is quick enough to point out that she once had a dragon husband too, so maybe we're seeing that as uh, a little bit of hint to his eventual plans. So it's a fairly jolly journey overall. Good food, good drinks, lots of information shared and sight seen, yet Tyrion still manages to cast a dark pool over it at the finish as he sings the famous song of Shay, perhaps because of Ilio's earlier talk about Sarah's saved hands. Hands of gold are always cold, but a woman's hands are warm. Yes, that old haunting returns as he remembers his vicious murder of Shay, while also remembering the happier time of their original meeting. Unfortunately, and unfairly for Shay, the reminiscing of her is barged out of the way in favour of Tysha instead, as Tyrion recalls another first kiss. The first kiss. The one he believed to be alive for half of his life, after so short a time thinking of it as the most perfect moment that had ever existed. And of course, thinking on such betrayal doesn't allow just for pleasant memories of Tysha, but of Tyrion's biggest ghost. His father uttering that famous phrase, and Tyrion killing him all over again. Sleep opened beneath him like a well, and he threw himself into it with a will and let the darkness eat him up. You'll recall a very similar line from his first chapter. This pain is not going anywhere soon, and there the chapter ends. On a very dark note. Even with all the travelling and the information learned, I would argue that Tyrion 2 is really much more similar to Danny 1 and John 1 in terms of setting the seeds for the future arc than his earlier chapter was. We get Griff and the Golden Company, we get Aegon, Danny not being where she's supposed to be, all in this chapter. It really is full of information and far more interesting than you would assume a really long carriage ride to be. No, not much plot progression here, strictly speaking, but a lot to think about. And there ends Tyrion 2. So we'll leave Tyrion on his Essos trip there, and we're going to do something that it just occurs to me now, we've never actually done before, which is go from Essos to Essos again. Yes, I did check, we don't even get it with Iron and Sam and Feast. This is a first for the entire series, as we move to our final chapter of the day in Quentin 1 slash The Merchant's Man. So this is the first of our fours. If you remember from the prep episode, we have a few POVs in a little kind of quad 
arc, quad, chapter, arc, and this is our first. We can separate it into quarters. That's nice and easy for us to dissect. And obviously this is the first today. It's also the opening of the dance only storylines, which to be fair, pretty much only includes Quentin and John Connington. And also in fairness, John Connington, we figure, is going to feature in wins. Quentin, not so much. Just to spoil his arc for you a bit there. Also, while we're doing a bit of a meta look, this is our first titled chapter for Dance of Dragons. This is obviously something that George kicked off with Feast. We saw a lot of those named uh, titled chapters there. We're going to get a lot more in Dance. And actually, strangely, this is the only one we get for the first kind of quarter of the whole book, really, if you count Reek as a name rather than a title. Even if it's not Fionn's proper name, still, I don't count that as a, as a title chapter myself. But this titling trend will really explode the further we go into the book. For example, of the final 16 chapters of Dance, a massive 10 of them are titles instead of names. So we get a big, big run. And I was going to read you just the list of those last 10. Instead, I'm going to read you the whole list of titled chapters we get in the Dance of Dragons. So grab your paper and pens. You can have a little quiz yourself here very quickly. I'll read one out, give you two seconds, see if you can guess who it is. I'm guessing you can. Now, obviously, you get a buy in the first round because you already know the first one up is the Merchant's Man, and I'm hoping you figured out who that is already. Like I say, I'm going to ignore Reek. I don't count that. The next one is the Lost Lord. Who do you think that is? It's, of course, John Connington. We actually have three in a row if you count the Lost Lord. The next is the Windblown. Yes, that's Quentin as well. Following that is the Wayward Bride. Hope you know that's Asher. About 10 chapters later, we'll have the Prince of Winterfell. Yes, that is Fionn. He changes from Reek into the title chapters, so that's pretty interesting. You can read a lot into that. His title chapters are perhaps the most telling of everybody's in terms of arc progression. Next is the Watcher. Yes, this is the famous camera that rides. It is Ario Hotar. Then the Turncloak. Yes, Fionn again. The King's Prize. Asher again. The Blind Girl. I think you know. That is Aya, a ghost in Winterfell. Yeah, you're getting the clue in the geographic name there. That's Fionn again. And then we're up to chapter 55, which is where this massive run at the end comes. So we begin with the Queen's Guard. Now that's a little difficult because that's our newbie. That's Sir Barry. Next is the Iron Suitor. Iron, always a big clue. That's Victorian. Then the Discarded Knight. That's probably the hardest one, I'd say, because you can apply that to quite a few people in the series. But that is Barristan. Follow that with the Spurn Suitor. That's our dear Quentin again. The Griffin Reborn. That's John Connington's second. The Sacrifice. It's Asher's last. The Ugly Little Girl, unfortunately, is Aya. And we have the Kingbreaker, which is a damn cool name. Yes, that's Sir Barry again. The Dragon Tamer. Oh dear. That's the end of Quentin's arc. Finally, the Queen's Hand, which is again, Sir Barry. Let me know how you did on that quiz. I'm sure a lot of you went 20 for 20 there. Yes, 20 title chapters in comparison to just nine in Feast. If you're wondering what that is as a percentage, so 20% of Feast chapters are titled, but 27% of Dance of Dragons chapters are titled. Don't worry, you haven't stumbled back into the prepper episode. That's just something I looked up off the top of my head because I'm just that nerdy. Let's get back to Quentin a bit here because he is the first of our new characters that we did explore a lot back in the prep episode. He's actually the only newbie for the entire first third of the book. As much as we're going to get of those guys overall, they'll be mainly relegated to later in the book. He has 18 chapters until we get our next newbie, John Connington. And it just so happens, Quentin's second chapter is right after that one, like we just discussed. So he really does get the opening act all to himself here, Quentin, so well done him. This is also a change in direction completely for the book. So far, it's been all catch up with who is where, what's happening with our old friends, and Tyrion has even snuck in his second chapter already. But as we mentioned before, Tyrion's second chapter really has the establishment motif of a second. With all of those, we of course had previous elements. We knew where John and Danny were, we know at least some of their crowd, especially in John's case. Even for Tyrion, in a new place and with new people for him, We've met them before, even if it was ages ago. And Bran, of course, has the same old group as usual. But Quentin is brand new as a POV. He's brand new as a character. We've never even met him before. And his supporting bunch are also new, as is his location, his city. This is our first visit to Volantis. So let's take a quick side step here just to have a look at that. This is the famous essential midway marker of Essos, really, that we've heard about several times, but never actually been to. 
Already in this book, thanks to Tyrion, it's been presented as the planned meeting point of Tyrion and Daenerys, even if we already know that's not going to happen. Prior to that, the name Volantis comes up 16 times in the first four books. Personally, I would have actually guessed it much, much higher, but there you are. In A Game of Thrones, it's only included in lists of associated locations. It's really not given any focus at all. In Clash, Crescent names it as where Stefan Baratheon found Patchface. In Storm, we're told that the new Lord Sunglass set sail from Dragonstone for the city after Stannis burned his predecessor. And then in Feast, it is touted as the origin of Savas. Nymeria Sand's mother supposedly came from there. There is a lot of talk of its connection to the slave trade. And, appropriately, considering who our POV is here today, Duran Martell tells of how he first met his wife, Melario, in Volantis. So in terms of three cities prior to actually being visited, we probably hear more of Volantis than we do anywhere else aside from Bravos. Perhaps the reason I thought it had been mentioned more is because it gets a huge 25 mentions in Fire and Blood. For the grand majority of fans, they've read The Merchant's Man long before Fire and Blood, so we can't really add in all that Fire and Blood teasing to us finally arriving here in Dance, but then again, that is not true for all fans, and it's worth noting anyway in terms of adding the place's general lore and history. Just to bring you up to speed, from Fire and Blood, we learn that Arglac Durandon, the last Storm King, once fought against the city, Volantis builders helped construct the Red Keep. Uh, it was the eventual destination of King Jaehaerys' strange daughter, Sarah. It was one of the destinations of Corlys Valerian, and there's some other notes in there as well. So really, what we are saying is that Volantis is an important location in the story, but in the past and likely the future also. For now, I'm probably overselling it. This Quentin chapter is very much a whistle-stop tour. We don't really see the city here. It'll be more in Tyrion 7, as well as some of his surrounding chapters, and actually in Victarion's first chapter as well, where we'll get a much better look at Volantis and its characteristics, its quirks, and its individualities. One would like to think we are not done with Volantis, and it's going to figure in some way to Daenerys' journey west, especially for the main bulk of whoever she's bringing with her, if they're going over land, or even if they're sailing. Volantis is a normal pit stop for everybody. Again, given that kind of midway marker status it has. It's basically the beacon of moving from the Slaver's Bay slash Giscari type of history to the beginning of the Free Cities. So that's going to be really interesting to see. Regardless of winds and beyond, we'll learn a lot of its importance to the slave industry, its affinity with the religion of the Red God, and again how it's politically set up in the tigers and the elephants and all these different things that they've got there. So we look forward to that in the future. But that's enough about the location. That's not really our focus here. I keep drifting from Quentin himself. So let's give him focus now. Who is this new guy? Well, it's Quentin, the Prince of Dawn, second in line to Sunspear, and obviously a pretty important guy. True, he was only mentioned once by name prior to A Feast for Crows, but thanks to Feast, he was propped up as a very important figure. First, as a potentially scheming rival to Ariane, a betrayer of her and their sibling relationship, but then clarified by Duran as a dutiful son obeying his father and trying to serve his country. Whichever we decided to think of him as from the end of that book, we knew his mission at least was a big deal. We've already spoken about how mind-blowing it is to add Tyrion to Danny's group and what that might bring to her. Well, now we might be allying her to an entire kingdom. Tyrion's huge as a character, no argument there, but he's still only one guy. Quentin might be providing the first tangible link to the world that Danny hopes to conquer. This might be her first real toehold on Westeros. So it's all finally becoming real. This is very, very exciting for us. It would be a huge, obviously, real influence to help Danny actually take the throne. Something's probably happening. It will help complete that Dornish vengeance that we spent so much time focusing on, both in Storm and Feast. And it's all just, again, terribly interesting. Not only that, but thanks to Arianne's chat with her father, we know this would be the reforging, kind of, of a plan long since failed in the plot to marry Viserys and Arianne. Okay, the players have had to change, but the essential plan, game plan, has remained. Forge, Martell and Targaryen together. Do right by the marriage of Rhaegar and Elia. Do right by a historical, hard-won and well-earned binding of the two families. Dawn and Targaryen are important to one another historically to the forging of the kind of modern Iron Throne as we knew it, as we were introduced to it, that's all very, very important. So the idea of their retaining that is very, very key and seems like a clear sign of what's to come. So with that idea of connecting Quentin to Feast, he himself might be a new character that we've never met, but thematically he is the continuation of the Dawn plotline previously carried by Ario, Ariane and Aris Okar as well. We know how big of a deal it was to include the Ironborn and Dornish plots in Feast, how big they figured in the structure of that story, and we discovered how much they mirrored each other as well. 
Some of that still exists in to dance, with Victorian carrying on the Ironborn plot and Quentin the Dornish. Yes, we do still have Asher and we get Fionn back, but they're really only involved in the northern plots in this book, so they don't really count. But Quentin is the bigger deal. He gets four chapters to Victorian's two. He actually arrives where he's supposed to go. Victorian hasn't made it yet. And he interacts with all the big names. He actually wins the Daenerys race. This big thing that we set up in Feast of all these people zooming right towards Daenerys. He gets there first. He wins. Except he doesn't. It's too late. She's already married. He doesn't get the girl. His and Duran's goals go unfulfilled. Which leads into a larger discussion about something sometimes brought up as a weakness or criticism of dance in general, even if I don't agree with it myself. What does Quentin provide this story with? Is he actually strictly needed? Does Quentin Martell affect the story as a whole in any great way? Well, that last question is a fool's errand. We don't have the story as a whole yet, so we, we just can't make the judgement. It might be that Quentin's freeing of the dragons at the end turns out to be a massively critical juncture in the marine plot that changes everything. It might turn out to just be a footnote of little consequence, or more likely, it's going to be somewhere in between. So what about looking at just dance in a vacuum then? We've got lots of single art books to compare him with, but not many finish with death. Although, ironically, the best one does. R.I.P. Eddard Stark. We meet Quentin, we see him reach marine, we see him meet Daenerys, we see him fail in his mission, and then he dies when he fails to go for broke and steal a dragon. So does that change the plot of Dance particularly? Well, no, not really. If we did remove him, we would lose some insight on Astapor and the sellsword situation, and obviously how the dragons escaped. If George really wanted to, he could get them out another way. Will the tattered prince and his Pentos promise come back importantly? Well, maybe, but it doesn't for Dance. So in that fashion, I think we can label Quentin as the Feast character of Dance. I've already said in multiple places that Feast was George stretching his wings a bit, getting in some of his anti-war and his anti-revenge messages. He was allowed to play around stylistically, etc., while leaving bigger plots for a bit later, mainly here. Whereas Dance is the reverse. It's very heavy on plot, obviously. So Quentin is the continuation of that spirit. This is George, again, allowing himself to flex out and play with a message or trope, which is well within his right, I might add. it. We're very lucky to get it. This time it is the theme or ideal of a travelling prince taking his band of merry men across the world to rescue a princess and save the day. We all know the story, and George wants to crush the idea in our minds. Of course he does, he loves doing that. He starts with Quentin himself. The princes of the classic stories we all know are normally, well, a Jamie, aren't they? We've discussed that about Jamie many, many times. Maybe a Loras. If we look across the appendices for the elder sons of major houses, we normally find a Rob. A Garland, someone tall and strong, good looking and charismatic. Okay, Garland's the second son, but you know what I mean. Unfortunately, Quentin is none of these. And that's not a dig, it's not a weakness, it's not like Quentin is some gargoyle, he's just a normal guy, he's just plain. And he has a personality that goes along with it. There's nothing wrong with that, the majority of the world are made that way, it just so happens he's been put in a position that needs a bit more. So George goes out of his way to point that out quite often actually. Especially once Quentin gets to Marine and meets Daenerys. Everyone's suddenly commenting on his looks and his charisma. and Even Barry gets on it. In those cases, I think George uses Quentin to comment more on Daenerys and society than he does Quentin. People, especially of a certain age, are often more attracted to those with a spark of danger or at least excitement. And that's also not a dig at Daenerys. She's not shallow here. It's just George commenting on the realities of the world. Again, Danny isn't being shallow or dismissive. She's just being human enough the normal trope of being swept up with someone merely because they have honourable intentions isn't going to work here. Quentin isn't going to arrive, say, Danny, I want to help you. Danny goes, okay, and off they go into the sunset. It's not going to happen. We're in far too complex of a story. Now that's a small example, and that's Quentin in physical form, but George's real aim is poking a hole in the idea of the grand adventure, the noble quest, the fairy tale that we mentioned a minute ago. And basically, what he wants to say about it is, it fucking sucks. He gives it away in the very first sentence of the chapter. Adventure stank. Yes, yes, George loves his sly little joke of using a ship name, but he's being direct with us here. No, really. It does damn stink. Adventure is awful. Instead of sailing across the world, picking up the girl, and swinging around to do right by his father's quest like we just mentioned, Quentin will instead have to sell his sword, take part in an absolutely brutal and disgusting campaign in Astapor, risk his life in double and triple crosses, suffer the humiliation and shame at failing of his ultimate task, and then, where the story usually goes that the prince will find some miraculous way to slay the dragon, will instead be burnt to a crisp. This is George's world. This is how serious the situation is. We've got no time for Knights of Summer anymore, as if we did before. We had some of this in how Brienne's noble quest turned out as well, but it's even more obvious here, I think. He fails. He out and out fails, there's no argument. He loses his life. 
This young guy who could have turned around and lived and still been a prince and brought much good to the world, doesn't. Now the reasons why he does that are obviously very complex and there's loads of them. We're going to get into them as we go through these chapters because it is very, very interesting. But before we even get to all that, let's consider that we meet Quentin after the worst has already happened to him. Well, apart from the dying thing. He's already lost three friends by the opening of this chapter. So that's the very worst result. What happens to yourself? Okay, that's one thing. But you brought others along on this jolly jaunt of yours and they died for you. They lost your lives because of you. As easily as pressuring for Quentin as anything that Duran and Dawn could have laid on his shoulders. Yeah, that, that's important, of course. But right from the off here, who already has to think that if he ever bulks, if he ever turns back, even after failing with Danny, that those guys, those good friends, died for nothing. It's that same push that causes Quentin to lose his life. That isn't supposed to happen. It's supposed to be a case of just grabbing your mates, jumping across the border, having some fun, wooing a girl and home in time for crumpets, or grilled snake in Sunsphere's case. A lot of that thinking will derive for how great houses tell their own history. They don't really focus on the failures too much. It's all achievement, achievement, achievement. Although you would think Duran would be a bit smart on that point. But some of it will also derive from youth, some of it from a genuine desire for adventure and success. That kind of thinking hits us all, especially in that younger age. But I think what George is telling us is that we are long past stories. If you're looking for fairy tale endings, you might want to expand the searchlight because this ain't it. This is real. This is brutal. This is the beginning of the culmination of the series. The surname did not protect Quentin Martel. Purpose didn't protect him. The role of being a prince, being Mr. Nice Guy, the history of Martel and Targaryen, none of it saved him from the realities of this war. Or perhaps, more succinctly, the realities of dragons. We've already seen it from Danny's first chapter. Dragons, they aren't noble. You can't apply that kind of characteristic to them. We might love them, because of course they do, but they are wild weapons. Do we think this is the last time this is going to happen? We've already had poor Hosea in our reread. Quentin, we know what's going to end up happening to him. Yeah, I think this kind of thing's going to happen much more, but a prince of the house most likely to align with you is kind of a bad start. Now this intro for Quentin has already gone on real long, but it does give us a lot more to explore after his final chapter. What is going to be his legacy here? What will Garrus and Archibald do? More importantly, how do Duran and Ariane react? As well as Dawn in general, they're already kind of pretty pissed about Martell's dying, aren't they? What does this mean for the aligning with Daenerys? Do they blame her? Does this definitely push them into bed with young Griff? There's going to be a lot to discuss when we finally get there. So yes, a long introduction, longer than anticipated, but we only get Quentin for a little while and he's a fascinating arc to explore. Allow me to try and wind it back just a tad. What are we dealing with today, save for that famous opening line? Obviously, we're working double time with the establishment of who these three are and what they're doing. We're setting up that nothing is going to go right with this trip, of course. And we're also building on this idea that Daenerys's Slave of Bay ripples have now extended out this far. That idea of all of Essos really being connected to this terrible trade. Already in this first chapter, there's the threat of being conned and killed, of failure and humiliation, and of course, its friends dying for nothing. Not things a prince is normally accustomed to. So let's get back to that opening line. Adventure stank. Yes, we've already covered that. Although I will note, I originally typed this out as Adventure Stark, which sounds like a pretty cool spin-off that we could do. So keep that in your back pocket. But we know George is having his little joke. Even in the following paragraph, that clearly shows he actually means a ship, we still get the same message behind these words. Things aren't what you hoped for. Not the ship that looks good, but then smells worse the closer you get, and not the grand adventure you're on. George makes the message clear from the start. These horrible rotting smells of corpses and other disgusts are pretty much what's in store for the three adventures from here on out. This is just, again, early, early establishment of tone. What's the other theme of Quentin's arc that we've already discussed? Fakery, playing the part, lies and betrayal. And we get that straight away from both Quentin and Jerris, but also the captain that they are meeting. Jerris opines about whether the captain will be as bad as the ship. It turns out he is. He also seems worse and worse the more you look at him. The pair will figure in a moment that the captain will just take their money and kill them once they get out to sea, which is a pretty fair bet. But at the same time, Quentin is talking about their own fakery and the roles they've had to play. Now, okay, they aren't planning on murder like the captain, but it's all in the same realm. No one is being upfront or honest. Everyone is trying to say whatever will get them ahead. Of course they are. This is the nature of the war climate that they are in. So that side of the noble quest Quentin might have been hoping for isn't even present at the start if it ever was before. Quentin lets us know early that already half of their noble squad has been killed. He's lost friends in this stinky adventure. We'll come back to that in a moment when Quentin himself has more time to focus on it. For now, we get our first good look at Geris, Jerris, Drinkwater. Yeah, if someone wants to take a little count here of how many times I switch between Geris and Jerris, well, I'd be interested to see the final tally. I'm going with 
Jerris. Jerris Drinkwater. I have no idea if that's right. Anyway, Quentin, he provides some useful information on his own looks by way of comparison between the two guys. Basically, Jerris is everything Quentin wishes he was. Confident, comfortable, apparently very charismatic. As we'll find out when Quentin thinks on the slain, he would have fit in right with the others, whereas Quentin himself basically seems like the safe choice. He's solid, he's dependable, he's just not that exciting. And take note of how critical Quentin is of his own appearance. It's not quite at Tyrion levels of self-hatred, but you see the same tendencies there. It's very effective for getting across what kind of nature this new POV has, and goes a long way to explaining why he's so desperate to find some kind of success later in the book. He believes he has nothing else to fall back on. Wouldn't it be nice to be the smiling, winning, kind of arrogant guy for once instead of Mr. Dependable? Would Mr. Dependable try and steal a dragon? In almost all cases in A Song of Ice and Fire, when we meet children or younger people, we comment on how aged up they are. Rob, John and Daenerys are prime examples, but really it's everywhere, children having to act older than we think they normally would do in our own world. And I was going to say, Quentin is the opposite, and his mental and emotional state seem much lower than his actual age, but having double-checked, he is only about 18 here. I always remembered him as older, I guess because Ariane is. So it makes a little bit more sense why he thinks this way. It really does frame things, it frames the arc differently, when you think of the burden placed on 18-year-old's shoulders and what he actually has to go through during dance. But let's zip back to this introduction to Jairus. Let's zip back to this introduction to Jairus though, seeing as we're doing our establishing. Jairus is a knight, though we know not how he reached that level. His family in general are apparently landed knights sworn to House Ironwood, so we can assume he's just grown up with the rest of these lads, as we'll again discover in a few pages when Quentin relates their kind of group history. Out of the free living, Jairus seems to have the best mix of skill. He's got the looks. He's pretty decent with a sword, even if he's not as valuable as Archbold in that respect. Although, remember, he'll save Quentin's life later on in the Great Pyramid. And most importantly, he's got the gift of the gab, as we see here in these early pages. He's got so much going for him that Barris and Samuel, later on, think that Danny might have changed her mind about marrying his Darzolarak if it had been Jairus who was Prince of Dawn rather than Quentin. Now, that's an annoying train of thought for me from Sir Barry because he basically believes Daenerys is just going to go with whoever's hottest, whoever excites the most. Okay, attraction is an important component, sure. But I feel that Barry should be giving her a little more credit here. She's a much more layered person than Barry's summation in that instance. And speaking of crummy attitudes towards Daenerys, Jairus will show some of that too. For all those advantages that we just listed, my favourite thing about Jairus Drinkwater, whom I quite like as a character, is that he is fiercely loyal to Quentin. You'd have to be, to sign up for this kind of thing anyway, but he shows multiple times throughout this book how much he values Quentin's life and just what he would do to protect it. And this is shown again after Quentin's death, when Jairus is just completely despondent. Unfortunately, he channels those feelings into blaming Daenerys for forcing Quentin to take such a stupid move in trying to free the dragons. No, no, no. We can't have that kind of thinking. Not here on the aisle. Quentin made that decision all on his own. Let's not keep up with the unfortunate trend of trying to blame women for men's reactions to women. Quentin was in his own mind, he made his own choice, he got himself burned. It's nothing to do with Daenerys. We can give Jairus a bit of a pass just for the high emotions at the time, but generally, it's not a good worldview. So let's switch back to some of his better traits. As mentioned, he is very, very loyal to Quentin. He tries to protect him, he tries to steer him in the right direction. And specifically, I'm again talking of later in the book, in Quentin's second to last chapter, The Spurned Suitor, when Jairus first tries to persuade his friend to follow the advice of Barat and Selmy and get the hell out of Marine because King Hizda does not like them, and there's no more Daenerys to keep them safe. This is after she's rode off on Drogon, obviously. Not only does he give that good advice, but when Quentin then floats the idea of trying to steal a dragon to make the trip and the deaths worth something, it's Jairus who keeps a rational head. Fuck your lineage, he says. Screw your ego. Stop being an idiot, basically. I added those last parts, but still. Stop trying to become a martyr, is what he's saying. It is Jairus Drinkwater who makes the wonderful argument that Quentin may fail in his mission. Okay, but he can pay back his father and Dawn a lot more easily if he's alive rather than if he's dead. That destroying yourself to pay homage or avenge someone already dead serves nothing, which ties into so many themes and arcs of much bigger characters that I really do love it. It's Jairus, and I'm, I know I'm skipping ahead very far here, but it's Jairus who has the immortal line, men's lives have meaning, not their deaths. That's a classic. We'll revisit that closer to the time, of course, but I just wanted to mention it because this really is a minor character that I can get behind. Last thing on Mr. Drinkwater before we progress, let's just keep an extra eye on him through this reread because he does have the potential to be an important piece for wins, especially early on during the Battle of Marine. So much happens at the end of this book that it's easy to forget Barristan does strike a deal with Jairus and Archibald. 
he will allow them both to go home with Quentin's bones, thereby saving them from death because they're due to be hanged, if they will agree to deliver terms to the tattered prince on saving Daenerys' hostages. Barry will pay Quentin's previously agreed upon price of Pentos if that is done. So that seems a little aspect they could pay off large in terms of perhaps swinging the loyalties of the wind balloon, or if George really is planning on promoting the Tattered Prince Pentos storyline later in the book. Or, even beyond all that, it is sure to be a key moment when Jairus and Archibald present Quentin's remains to Duran, in what would be a quite similar scene to what we had in Daenerys 1, wouldn't it? A father having to put up with his child's burnt bones. Will Jairus still blame Daenerys by that point, and therefore influence Duran's reaction, or will he have cooled? There's a lot of questions, so we can see that it could be pretty important. The downside is, it's hard to see any POV having access to any of this, unless Aria Hotar is successful in what he's up to, and then returns to Sunspear, but key to think of anyway. That was a long divergence for me there, so let's get back to the present day, where Jairus is still bartering for passage to Marine, and Quentin is still showing off his low self-esteem, as he wonders what he could possibly offer Daenerys, this woman that he's chasing. Basically, he believes the only good thing about him is his bloodline. He represents all of Dawn, and he's resolutely sticking to that idea throughout this story. And he's not wrong, to be fair. Danny does want Dawn. It's just that she wants peace and safety for so many of us first. We get perhaps a hint of their youth that they decided to be Dornish wine merchants when generally, I think I'm right in saying this, we've seen Dornish wine is not well received in the rest of the world. Although neither is the stuff they have in Marine, so maybe it does check out. Regardless, this passage with the captain is supposed to give us some context for the wider situation. Basically, it's not good. War is everywhere and it's soon to be headed to Marine. As we covered in Danny's first chapter, at the moment she believes the war to be inside her walls, but it's not going to stay that way. The Volantines are being recruited, we get the first mention of several sellsword companies that are going to get involved, one of which being the Golden Company. So that's a nice bit of chapter sequencing and connecting for the readers there. And again, we are doubling down on the point that what Danny's done in Slaver's Bay is absolutely not staying in Slaver's Bay. This is going to affect everybody. While Jerris tries to insist our three companions aren't involved in any of that, it's not a good sign of things to come. It's just unavoidable. That's how gravitational, that's how big Daenerys is. Quentin gives some great description on the look and feel of Atlantis, especially its gigantic harbour and the hundreds of different types of ships there at the moment. It really contributes to this feeling of it being another meeting point in the middle of the continent, a little like we described Vastoff Rack as back in the day. And again, all these different people from all over the world, it really, it's just gravity. Daenerys is the Steph Curry of the, of the SL Stadium. Yes, I'm going to stick with that analogy, I think. We also find out Quentin and the others have spent 20 days trying to find passage, despite all these hundreds of ships, because absolutely no one wants to go to Marine right now. It's danger and death. If only these three had listened, because these captains are right. But this particular captain they're talking to does agree for thrice the usual passage. And Jerris shows off his value with some fine acting to say the deal is done, only to confirm these green boys do indeed have some wits about them when they walk away and say, mm, no thank you. To sail with said captain would mean actual death or enslavement, and definitely no marine. So it's back to the drawing board. Both men are deflated, and they reflect on their lack of enthusiasm for their current location. A sweet man, Jerris said afterwards. The air hung hot and heavy, and the sun was so bright that both of them were squinting. This is a sweet city, Quentin agreed. Sweet enough to rot your teeth. I draw some comparisons between Volantis and King's Landing here. The latter is also supposed to be this standing place of opportunity and wealth and power, but we well know it's rotted, really. That assertion, combined with complaints about heat and sweat, really remind me of Eddard Stark first arriving at King's Landing, when his tunic was always heavy and sweaty, he just didn't like it. Of course, Ned was hot because he'd come from the north, so it's just hot by comparison. These guys have come from Dawn, which tells you something about the atmosphere in Volantis. Later on, Quentin will say it's the dampness of the heat that frustrates him when he is so used to more crisp heat of home and the relief of night, whereas Volantis saps his strength and leaves him feeling dirty. Yes, that's definitely reminiscent of Ned early on. We get some further world building on the city as we read about Hathes and the slaves who drive them, specifically on the different tattoos they have been branded with. And that leads Quentin to think of Maester Kedri's stat of there being five slaves for every free man in Volantis. And let's not deny we're imagining what that could mean if Danny were to march on the city. And that in turn has Quentin finally forced to relay the sorry tale of the three friends they've already lost. And I think they are purposely not given that grand of a tale by George. None of them die diving in front of an arrow meant for Quentin. None were rescuing a maiden or staying behind so the others might get away, as we'd often find in other tales of glory. No, they died when you get down to it because of a random robbery on the sea. This passage is a great glimpse into the mindset of the beginning of this quest. 
I really love this quick paragraph of Will and Cletus talking before they leave. It's a bit of banter, some high spirits, then the knights of summer off to earn some fame and win some women. Here's a quote for you. Later, in the planky town, the Dornishman had toasted Quentin's future bride, made ribald japes about his wedding night to come, and talked about the things they'd see, the deeds they'd do, the glory they would win. That's just a perfect way of putting it, of getting that idea across to us. And then before you know it, Quentin is having to remember these happy-go-lucky types, taking their last dying breath in his arms, and the pain of not even being able to be genuine in their funeral rites. So we have some more of that fakery theme. The idea of adventure died with those three men. The other three have been left with the reality. It was not supposed to end like that for them, Quentin thinks. As well as that being a motivating factor, perhaps Ghost Quentin will think the same for his own end later on. It does say something that two of these dead three were young nobles. They had a good place in the world. They were allowed the comfort of growing up with such ideas of this being an easy jaunt out into the world. Not everyone gets that opportunity. Let's compare them with, let's say, Gendry. When he and I were setting out for the war with Yorin, Hooray, Yoren mentioned. He wasn't giddy over the chance of seeing the world and having an adventure. He had already experienced the toughness of life, and he was far younger than these Dornish fellows. Because remember, Quentin is the youngest of this group. They left their protective bubble and found that life wasn't so easy. That's not to blame them, particularly. It's not 100% on them, it's just a fact. Let's take the opportunity to have a closer look at the three deceased, because as we've discussed a lot lately, George is way too good at consequences and fleshing out to just leave them as bland 2D shapes with no further connection. Let's begin with the big name, Cletus Ironwood. And yes, I will admit, I do in my mind always say Yon Wood first, but I won't. I'll stick to Ironwood this time, I'll be good. What do we know of this young man? He is the eldest son of Lord Anders Ironwood, current patriarch of that house and clearly an important man. Most would say that Ironwoods are the second most powerful house in Dawn, so clearly big stuff. Cletus is not heir, however. He has an older sister. I'm not sure how you say her name. I think it's Enos. I'm going to go with Enos. She's already married and has children of their own. So there's a similarity of Quentin there. Perhaps they bonded over that. And he was also cousin to Archibald, still living Archibald. Cletus himself is the jolly one, always laughing and joking with women as we saw in that little flashback. It seems he was the real popular guy that steady Quentin attached himself to. And don't forget, of course, Quentin fostered with the Ironwoods. That seems to be the breeding ground for this little group. But it was Cletus who seemed to be the sole centre. He was the real life of the party. We have further evidence of him being the natural leader as he took on the role of the merchant in their original memory. That's all we really know of Cletus the man, but his surname might have impact later on. As I said, the Ironwoods are the second most powerful house in Dawn, which makes them very powerful indeed. Many readers have wondered if they will become more involved in the grand stage and be a bigger player going forward. We often speak of how Duran is going to react to news of Quentin's death. We've just done it. Should we not ask the same of Anders Ironwood, learning about his eldest son? Will this make him rebel against the Martells, as the Ironwoods did originally, when that family was first formed a long, long time ago? It's very possible. Anders, who has a cool nickname in the Blood Royal, is currently up in the Boneway with his own host on Duran's orders, so it will be interesting to see if they are put to use. Certainly, Ariane considered him a cunning man who wielded dangerous power, and a lot of the fandom have wondered you know, all these different Dornish lords. We've seen it throughout history. They are very proud. They are often very individualistic. Duran has often wondered how strong his grip on rule is. He knows how quick the Dornish can turn and go for their own thing. So will we see any of that? Very, very possible. And if we want to look at some kind of more recent history, the Ironwoods fought against the Targaryens in three of the five Blackfyre rebellions, which is obviously against the Martells. So take that for whatever it's worth. And remember, even more recently, they have an old grudge for Oberyn killing Anders' grandfather after sleeping with his paramour. Geographically, they are also very, very important. They control that boneway that Anders is currently in, and and that serves as the main entrance to Dawn. So I'd love to see how that's going to be utilised, perhaps by Daenerys or others, we're not sure. Anders hasn't shown any sign of wanting to defect against Duran, as far as we know, and it would be hard for him to run off and swear vengeance against Corsairs, but I think his Dornish blood will demand something. In general, I think we're all just expecting that larger picture of Dornish nobility entering the fray with the Danes or whatever Darkstar is up to, and it wouldn't be surprising if the Ironwoods are part of that. In our next victim, we get almost the complete opposite in Sir William Wells. We have almost no information on him personally or his house historically. Why he was included in the plan or how he knows Quentin specifically and the others is left to our imagination. It's most likely he was also fostered at Ironwood and just grew up with them. Besides that, he is giving no distinguishing features at all. We don't know what he looked like or who he was, only that he died. And his house has zero background as well. We only know of one other Wells currently living. 
Sir Theoden Wells, who's joined the Sparrows in King's Landing. There is a semi-canon source that says there is a House Wells in the north as well, so Sir Theoden could belong to that one instead, but you'd think it unlikely a Northman has invested that deeply into the faith of the Seven. It's not impossible, though. So is Sir Theoden even a relation to William? We don't know. We don't know how William became a knight or anything else, and we likely won't. Cletus will get any future headlines if there are any. And Quentin himself uses this time to reflect on perhaps the weightiest loss of Maester Kedry. Yes, after all that focus to feast, I'm sure you remember, it's taken us this long to hear about any new maesters. The only one we've heard about so far in this book is Maester Aemon. Again, we don't know much about Kedry. But that is very much the norm for his line of work, isn't it? How long Quentin knew him, whether he was a friend as well as a colleague, or someone his father just insisted upon being taken, is left a mystery, as Quentin instead relates how the man was a master of languages. Apparently, Kedry could speak any tongue from any of the three cities. I feel we should pause and nod at how absolutely incredible such a skill is. He was fluent in damn Giscari of all things. This is obviously a very, very intelligent guy. I don't think we've ever met anyone similar. I don't remember anyone having that kind of command over languages. And I also don't remember, correct me if I'm wrong on this, languages being a focus of study at the Citadel. Is that a link you can get on your chain? Maybe it is. But I don't remember it as being so, so makes it all the more impressive, doesn't it? Languages have always been present in the series, mainly thanks to Daenerys, because she's always been an Essos. And although that theme did extend a little bit in Feast, it's something else that Dance really takes a hold of and embiggens. And we're probably going to see it most in Tyrion's chapters, but Quentin will have his share too. And if even this early stage is showing what Maester Kodri would have been worth this mission for the single skill alone, as well as everything else a maester provides, we will definitely know how much he was worth by the end of Quentin's arc. Unfortunately, it's a last of arms for all three, isn't it? But they're gone, and they're not coming back. Meanwhile, we're brought back to the present again, and the pair are still lamenting this damn city, and they're weighing up their options. It's possible they can get to New Geese, and then try again and find passage to Marine from there, but Quentin vetoes that. Half because New Geese is also allied with Yunkai, so this chapter really is serving as this feeling of build-up and entrapment for lots of bad things heading Danny's way. Quentin's even smart enough to realise if Atlantis also allies with Yunkai, it really is bad news. So the two gents continue to bounce off one another. Jerris given a possible solution, Quentin shooting it down. He reckons that Jerris sees it as a light-hearted game and it's left up to him to be realistic. It's up to him to be the warrior and feel the burden. He thinks this. He leaves that to me. He knows my nature is as cautious as his is bold. So Jerris gives another option, this time supplied by the mysterious big man we are yet to meet. Leave the sailing to all the others who do it in this book, and go over land instead. Yes, it's chapter sequencing again, as we talk about the Valerian Roads, specifically the Demon Road, which we're obviously meant to wonder about. But that's also no good for Quentin. He's worried Tywin Lannister is going to hear about Daenerys and send his own forces. So that's firstly a bit of a laugh for us readers, because it seems so long ago to us since Tywin died, but also in the fact he was told about Daenerys and did nothing. Varys tried, he really did. The best news and most complete news comes after his death, sure, but no one is coming from King's Landing, ironically. You'd be hard-pressed to make Cersei even think about Daenerys, let alone do anything about her. She was far too preoccupied. At Jairus' light-hearted suggestion they just give up and turn around, Quentin thinks this. Crawl back to Sunspear defeated, with my tail between my legs? His father's disappointment would be more than Quentin could bear, and the scorn of the Sand Snakes would be withering. Duran Martell had put the fate of Dawn into his hands. He could not fail him, not whilst life remained. So we can see how important this is to him, how heavy the burden, and why he makes the later choices that he does is made very, very clear. After some more highlighting of very Volantis type things in iron chain shops and savas pieces and temples, Quentin gives some more background on how he's also quite unlucky in love. It seems he's only ever loved one woman, Enos Ironwood, who went off and lived a life without Quentin ever summoning the bravery to tell her how he felt. Since then, he's had but a single kiss, and the whole thing just makes him very uncomfortable now, which obviously plays in quite strongly to what his actual mission is. He's supposed to go and woo the most beautiful woman in the world, certainly one of the most important and powerful, and he can't even work out which drink water twin he kissed. This is a man whose entire romantic outreach into the world has gone as far as his mate's sister's. No wonder he thinks he really does need Dawn, and that former agreement made before Danny was even born, behind him to sweeten the deal. I never asked for this, he thought. That's similar to Danny's thoughts about the Miranis. It really isn't the mindset you want to be starting this adventure with. Yet, now we get yet more world building of Volantis. I believe I was unfair in my initial analysis. I have to say I'll put my hand up. 
we get a lot more of this city in the chapter than I thought. This time we see the black wall, which is 200 feet high and wide enough for six chariots to race across. Suck it, Westerosi castles. But then again, I always have the feeling George never concentrates on details such as Lee's unless we're supposed to see them fail later on. We also learn about the Long Bridge, the two halves of the city, and a little bit about the Triarchs and their makeup, the vastly different ruling and political structures that we see here, and you again have to think it's going to be used by George at a later point in the story. We get so much set up between this and Tyrion and Victorian chapters. Right here we see the new election is due soon and we're told about the tigers and the elephants for the first time. We won't concentrate on those elements too much now, Tyrion will do a bit of that first later on, but it's just that establishment and sprinkling in again. For now, the two continue on to Fishmonger Square which definitely lives up to its name and they just so happen to see two dwarves riding a pig and a dog. I think we know who it is, don't we? It's such an amazing connection to set up that Tyrion is going to meet Penny here in Volantis. She's here, right there. It's something you'll almost certainly only notice on a second read. Even if you do catch it first time, you're probably not expecting one of these two to become an important character going forward. Unfortunately, as rereaders, we know that the brother, Penny's brother, is soon to meet his end, which is it's really emotional, it's dark. The irony is, of course, that Penny will get a ship, whereas Quentin doesn't, and will get to Marine as well. To close the chapter, which I will again apologise to for saying it doesn't give that much of a glimpse of Philantis, we wind up at the Merchant's House, which is said to shelter traders from all places, where we likely focus on the masked shadow binders from a shy apparently being there. Ooh, that's always interesting thanks to Melisandre's increased role, but masked shadow binders will definitely be more interesting thanks to Danny's next chapter. Before they enter, we get two seconds to focus on another sellsword company, currently aiming to go and fight against Daenerys, so another layer on top of that atmosphere building. We can see their pretty simple recruitment tactic. Come with us, have a good time, take whatever you want. That is going to work on a lot of people in this world, because, well, it's probably better than the situation you're in. And you'd imagine most sellsword companies are doing the same type of thing. They even try the old ego-baiting thing when Quentin and Jairus turn away, return to their rooms, and finally introduce us to the third member of the group, Sir Archibald Ironwood, the big man, which I like as a nickname, probably because I love asking one. This time, the introduction really is lightning quick. We get a physical description of exactly what earns him the name Big Man, two sentences from him, and then that's it. So though he doesn't really feature here, let's just give a very quick look at Archibald and his place in the story. He is also of House Ironwood, so he's an important guy, even if he's only a nephew to the current Lord. He's obviously playing the role of Mr. Muscle, and is really in the upper echelon of physically dominant fighters, and, as is made very, very clear at the beginning, he gets very seasick. While it's true Archibald does want to solve most problems with his hammer, he's a far cry from the trope of big dumb guy. He's also incredibly loyal to Quentin. He plays at the mummery with only a little less finesse than the other two, and actually, after Quentin's death, he's much more emotionally calm than Jairus in dealing with Barristan and figuring out what to do next. He's the one who keeps his head. He's another great character, another easy one to love. I think that's done on purpose so that at the end of this book, with the mission in complete tatters, them arrested in a war zone, and now four of their friends dead, we really do feel for Jairus and Arch. But that's all to come. For now, Archibald suggests they travel across the demon road so they can avoid a sea, but Quentin again vetoes it. He's a real uh, annoying guy for that. Once again, it's left to Jairus to come up with another option, one that Quentin will at least listen to. It's not an adventure, and it's not the demon road. It's something even less honourable. George leaves it to us to guess what their solution is, but we've seen enough of Harry's structured secrets and chapters to probably guess it has something to do with these windblown that we've just seen outside. Let's pretend we're enraptured with these promises of gold and women and glory and hitch a ride. It's not ideal, it's downright dangerous, and we're going to be on the wrong side, we're going to be against an heiress, so something will have to be sorted out later, but it's an idea, and one that Quentin accepts because he is so desperate. Obviously, it robs them all the wrong way. Pretending to be merchants is one thing, but sellswords are generally despised in Westeros. They are going to become literal turncloaks who will have to betray or desert at some point, and it's just not what was once dreamed. But as we've seen, so little of this adventure is. It's just a weird smell all over the place. And that is the end of Quentin slash The Merchant's Man. That is the end of part two of A Dance of Dragons for Scraps and Scrolls. Well done, everybody. There's a long old episode, four big chapters there, four enjoyable chapters. I quite like all of them, to be honest. We're recording, well, we're going on for three hours. These two first episodes, monster, just huge. And well, that might just be the same for all through this book, might it? Hopefully you're enjoying more of it. Please let me know if you need me to shut up earlier, just say the word. But hopefully you're enjoying these early chapters as well. Again, let me know. What do you think? What are your thoughts on these questions? please do get in contact, interact with us as much as possible. Now, I asked the question earlier on, which did you think we would spend the most time on today? 
Well, I'm hoping you got it right. It was actually the last chapter. It was Quentin. Probably because he's a newbie and we had to do all that intro and then look at all these characters that aren't even in the chapter. They've already died and stuff like that. So Quentin is the longest. Maybe we'll keep that a quiz for every week. See if you can guess who's going to get the most attention. Speaking of, why don't we have a look at who it is next week? You can already start thinking about who we're going to have to talk about the most. Like today, we are going to start with John 2. A very tough chapter. It's the replay chapter. Yes, we've already seen this before. It is a bit deja vu. But John tells Sam, off you hop, you're going down south. Unfortunately, we see the even worse conversation with Gilly. But we do get a, a nice ending. I won't spoil it for you, but it's a good fan moment. From there, it'll be Tyrion 3. A very important chapter. Where we meet Rolly Duckfield and Halden Halfmaster and Griff. And more importantly, Young Griff. Yes, this guy we've already been talking about so much already is actually going to be here in the flesh. What a monumental moment that is. But after that, it's another first chapter. It's one we've been waiting for. Oh yes, it is Davos 1. Yes, 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 the captain returns. Here we go. It's been such a very long time since Davos 6 of Storm of Swords. A very, very long time indeed. But we're back. And well, Davos, he's not having the best time of it. We go to Sisterton, another new place for us. And we set up Davos's incredible arc. But I know we all love. And then we're actually getting our first double portion of dance because we're going to end with a John as well. John 3, where quote unquote Mance gets burned. And John has some more very interesting interactions with Stannis and his bright but not so warm sword. So we've got all of that next week. Start having a think which one are we going to be focusing on the most. Like I said at the beginning, do check out our Patreon, leave reviews and ratings and all those things if you've got the time. Have a look at that new short story I posted, it might be of interest to you. Hopefully it will be, let me know your thoughts either way, and we will see you next week for Dance with Dragons Part 3. Thank you everybody, so very much appreciated, see you next time.